Wait, can you hear me now? Hold on a second. Can you hear me? Dang, okay, so I had my I had my volume off, which is interesting. Uh, unexpected. This is not the volume. Yeah, so. Alright, <laughs> so my fault, uh, is, is the volume good? Uh, yeah, okay, so my fault, I uh, messed up and totally forgot about the stupid thing not automatically doing my volume, so, yeah. Alright, uh, wow, I was about to do the whole thing with no volume, can you imagine that? <laughs> Alright, let's go back into the beginning. Alright, so... This right here is the saga of the black Marxist versus the black nationalist, a debate resurrected by Yosef Ben Yakinen. Uh, what I was saying, if you were good at reading lips, was that uh, Dr. Ben was one of the uh, last, was one of the original nationalists, okay? He was one of the original nationalists in the sense of, like, one of the original, or not original, but like, one of the Garveyites, as opposed, like, basically, African people branched out into yeah th thank you man thank you mchaka uh 97 young guy all right <laughs> all right so uh basically what happened was uh uh joseph ben yakinen was a a garveyite uh and as a garveyite like a lot of a lot of the scout a lot of the people before us weren't garveyites so you have someone like uh what's his name uh Dr. Clark, I was telling you, Dr. Clark was not a Garveyite. He was a socialist, right? And so there's a difference between a Marxist and a nationalist in the uh, in the in the Pan African paradigm. And essentially, someone like Marcus Garvey was not about you know this Marxism in a sense. You know, he was more about you know we as African people have to develop our own system independent of <coughs> sorry, let me vote but independent of white people and uh, and white ideas. And, and so that's, that's what this book's about. So I was reading to you this right here. It says, from the teachings by indigenous Africans, black people of the Nile Valley and Great Lakes re region, mystery systems uh, centered in the Grand Lodge of Luxor. So what I was saying was that what I call Waset is the Grand Lodge of Luxor and its subordinate lodges established by said Africans in Asia and Europe as conquerors, civilizers, teachers, and diviners. So that's another thing to remember that Africans were conquerors as well as civilizers and teachers and diviners uh, in, in our in our ancient timeline so so but but that's something that to re re remember that you know basically Africans did conquer other places so even though we're saying oh I don't like conquest and all that right like that is actually our legacy you know so when Wazungu does all this conquest and conquering he's doing what he's picked up from us you see what I'm saying like a lot of a lot of what uh, was picked up from us is that. So here are the other works by him. Uh, you already know. Uh, I was actually, this is actually a pretty interesting book. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of the backstory of everything. Oh, look, he has school textbooks for children. I didn't even know that. Africa the land. So that's probably something that uh, I should definitely look into. Um, but yeah, let's go right into it because this is actually a pretty big book, and I'm, I'm hoping to uh, get through it. For you guys. So, if I had no definite political ideology, I am in fact existing in limbo. Yet, on the other hand, if my political ideology isolates me from my fellow Africans to the point where I believe that mine and, you know, Amon's, any one of hundred, any one of the hundreds, he says, and God's, any of the hundreds are one, I am in fact already a living dead, for ignorance is contemptible, even in the eyes of and his goddesses, Ra Isis. Okay. So, so that was like a thing. So, to whom I am addressing all of my remarks to follow in the text of these three volumes, one, two, and three, certainly to those who preach, preach from their street corner ladders the following words Africa for the Africans, those at home and abroad. So, you see, he's a Garveyite. He's like a real Garveyite, as opposed to, like I said, other people, right? Uh, they were at the, t are the so called irresponsible blacks like myself, your author. Uh, thus, each and every word in these volume books are dedicated to the unknown heroes and heroines who, in their w own way and form, preached. Should I make this bigger? Let me see. Is it, is it big enough? Let's make it a little bigger. Hold on a 
25. All right. Uh, who preached the one and only true African black philosophy at Marcus Garvey, Adam Clayton Vought, Adam Clayton Kyle Jr., Malcolm X Square. So, Arthur Reed, Carlos Cooks, Ross the Killer, Abdul Sophie, James Thornhill, Jimmy Lawson, Ilambe Brath, Eddie Porkchop Davis, Sister Bessie Phillips, Louis Michaud, Sister Lucille Shorty, Charles Kenyatta, a 27X, Arnold Lewis, George E. Simmons, Abdul Krim, Bro Mahim of the Black Brotherhood, and even myself, Yosef Ben Yakinen, along with countless others. So he's talking about the, the Garveyites. These are the Garveyites uh, back in the day. So you see Carlos Cooks, obviously. Uh, this this guy, I heard of him before. Uh, Eddie da Porkchop Davis. Alame Brath, you know Alame Brath. He's the one who, who created the uh, like Black is Beautiful stuff. right? Yosef Ben Yakinen is another one of the true... Uh, the true Thing. So, like I said, again, him and Dr. Clark, although we compare the two, like Dr. Clark was not a Garveyite in that sense, you know. Uh, he was, but he was, he was, a, he, was a, he was an excellent historian, but he wasn't a Garveyite in the same way as uh, Dr. Ben was. Uh, so, every one of us, too many already dead, in the tradition of the Great One and of the men of the people of our motherland, Africa, founder and president general of the United, Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, there were at the start. These were are the stalwart African blacks who kept African black consciousness alive when most African blacks in the so-called diaspora were are still ignorant of their African origins and heritage, cultures, religions, history, ad infinitum, all of which preceded the creation of Adam and Eve by the ancient Hebrews no longer than CA 3670 BCE, BC at best, but recorded in CA 700 to 500 BCE in their holy scriptures, otherwise called the five books of Moses, Torah, Pentiach, uh, Old Testament, Kamesh, allegedly written by God, uh, Jehovah, UA, Holy Scribes. All right. So let's see. Although originally completed in 1976 AD, the issues and conditions. Let me see. What's this? This is a great book. Clark wasn't a baby. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Clark was a socialist, you know? So I'm going to write that down. Clark was a socialist, you know? Uh. Yeah, and so Garvey, Garveyism and, and socialism were not one and the same, you know. Uh, and this is this is going by the strict adherence to uh, black nationalism as expressed, uh, African nationalism as expressed by Marcus Garvey, you know, who was more or less hostile to the the Marxists, and and you know they they had debates and so on and so forth. Well, this is more like the strict fundamentalist African nationalism. Uh, all right. All right. The strict fundamentalists of Garveyism. Yeah, they were also socialists. Yeah, the, the, like the UNIA. So that's the thing with Tony. Tony Martin was talking about how a lot of the socialists infiltrated the UNIA. But let's let's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm do this. Based on the habit happening, one can be certain that the observations of the three volumes will remain the same. They will change, but remain the same. Uh, none of this is less holy and sacred as the sacred scribes or any religion anywhere in the known world. That is the truth, even for Jews and Christians. Yeah. All right. A reminder to our so-called Negro, Black, amalgamate, colored, amalgamated intellectuals, Jomo Kenyatta. All faith is false. All faith is true. Truth is the shattered mirror strewn in myriad bits, while each believe his little bit the whole to own. Uh, when the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land. The missionaries had the Bible. They taught us to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had the land, and we had the Bible. You know. So from Abraza, Ab uh, so he has a lot of footnotes. I don't even know where he's referencing it though. Oh, okay, zero 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 zero. You see it? All right, I'm pointing, but like there's a zero, there's a zero zero. All right, uh, extracted from the California Voice. Blah blah blah. Okay, so these are the offerings. Oh, he does offerings, glossary, purpose, so on and so forth. This is the table of contents, and we're gonna go into it. Oh, okay, so here's the glossary. This is words chronologically listed. To appear in the text. So this is African black people. So I actually want to go to this glossary, you know, so bear with me on this one. Uh, African black people. These are the indigenous to the continent by birth or descent, irrespective of shade, of blackness, etc. So he's basically saying he's not into the colorism. He's not into the uh, whether you're, you know, you know, whether you're light, whether you're dark, whether you're, you know, he's just like, if you have the scent, pretty much, uh, which, is, which is a way to look at it. And so, so there's an African sensitive in the tradition of that's the things of the world. Yeah. 
uh, Marxist, a follower of the night. Well, okay, so yeah, but he was like basically Clark would have been a Marxist. So this is what we're gonna read what Marxist is. So uh, a follower of the 19th century CE German philo Jewish philosopher, political activist, student of Frederick Eng Engels, concept of the communist state, etc. That's a Marxist. A socialism is the economic basis for the distribution of the working class. A economic basis for the distribution of the working class wealth in a society between management, uh, the state, and labor. So this is the methodology for achieving the state of communism according to Marx and Engels theories. So so socialism, uh, according to this is this is how Dr. Ben would put it. This is how Baba Ben would put it. This is the e economic basis for the distribution of the working class wealth in a society between management and labor, and it's a means towards communism. So he says Clark actually rejected Marx. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, but socialism would be a means towards uh, uh, communism, in a sense. Like, like I, th I think that's where, like, like there's a difference between communalism and 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 socialism, in a sense. I, I would I would posit, or I wouldn't hope, but the idea of you know an engine towards communism, which would be a global a phenomenon, right? That right there is uh, is remarkable. And again, it has nothing to do with Garvey in that sense, you know. All right, so capitalism, the economic basis of the distribution of the working class wealth distributed by the money investor who takes a share of the net profit because of his investment. His share is sometimes unrelated to the overall value, only to supply and demand or whatever the market will bear after middlemen take their share for handling only. Right, so that's a really important, uh, it's a really important uh, summary of capitalism. You know, but, but you could see kind of how essentially, you know, it's, it's the question of what, how is the working class wealth distributed, you know? And, and essentially, in capitalism, it's distributed by the investor, whereas in socialism, it's distributed by the state. And in communism, it would be, uh, it would be like, just a, just a whole other thing. Uh, to the ujama of, yeah, the conscientiousness of Lincoln, yeah. Uh, dialectics, the art of examining opinions or ideas logically, mostly by questions and answers in order to determine the validity of that being Examined in the case of the Marxists, this type of artistic behavior is equally called scientific. You know, so he called it artistic. Okay, chauvinism, uh, fanatical patriotism, unreasonable attachment to a lost cause, boastful devotion to one's country, race, sex, class, etc., with uh, a contempt for any other. Originally a phrase related to Nicholas Chauvin, who refused to accept that the imperial cause in France was lost, even though he was a soldier of Napoleon the First. Chauvinism. Uh, Just making sure that I can be here. All right. Uh, black power, as used by Dr. Edwin Edward Wilmot Blyden in circa 1883, Marcus C. Marcus M. Garvey in circa 1923, as against militant activist brother Stokely Carmichael in the 1950s and 1960s, circa uh, civil rights movement, mean different things, but mainly carrying the same philosophical thought of black people, Africans having their own power as white people, European having theirs on the backs of other peoples. Right? So red baiting. Uh, okay, somebody actually said that before. So a phrase developed by members of the Communist Party and other Marxist or socialist movements left or center, left of center, etc. Originally similar in content to the word chauvinism, but solely directed to the people falling in the category already outlined herein. The condemnation of a person solely because he or she is a red. Okay. New left, named for a contemporary socialist, mar communist, Marxist, etc., whose method of understanding and practicing Marxism may be different from the original version employed by old line Leninists, Trotskyists, Stalinists, etc. Uh, today, it's Maoism, right? So so then this would be where you would fit in, like like how Afromac is telling us about uh, Nyere and Nkrumah, uh, like this is where you probably fit in Dr. Clark too, in the new left, you know. Uh, but again, like like you you have to be like really particular as to whether this is a, a, a Garveyism or not. And um, yeah, so militant uh, originally one who rebels against an existing order to bring about meaningful changes, as seen by the protester. Generally, one who sees his or her struggle against the system in power in terms of a class struggle, a democracy of Greek origin. It's a Greek thing. Right. That's why I like Dr. Ben. He's just he's just like he's not trying to borrow from anybody else. He's just straight up black African. Straight up. All right. 
uh, democracy of or Greek origin, the freedom of expression and movement, generally meaning in the United States of America, a system of government by and for the people, which was never a fact in ancient or modern Greece, either by direct election of the government's representatives or where the officials rule by their consent, etc., etc., etc. Rule by majority could be said to be the cardinal ingredient of this word. <coughs> right? Uh, yeah. Uh, black philosophy, oh, sorry, minority, a member of the people who are not a part of the ruling group in power in any society, right? So a member of the people who are not a part of the ruling group in power in any society, of course, you know, I guess he hasn't seen South Africa, <laughs> right? But I'm just joking. Uh, such a person is always at a disadvantage to the majority and must very often find his or her democracy in the role of a militant, since by virtue of the rule by majority clause, he or she is guaranteed failure. And you see, like, this is something that I would tell you. This is something that I would tell you. You wouldn't listen, but here it is. If you're a minority, yeah, you're going to be this little militant, this little rebel, this little blah, blah, blah. But that's on you. Like, don't be the minority. It's that simple. Just don't be the minority. You know, because, because this, you know, you, you, like, like, like a lot of times you're going to see these videos of black folk and they're like, man, they're always locking us up. They're always going to lock us up. They, they, they use their Yeah, they're going to use their gels. You are a minority population. You're not supposed to be in charge. You're, you're not the ruling group. You know? And, 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 and I mean, obviously, like I said, you know, Nazania and like all over Africa, that's a little bit, there's an exception to that. But, but that's on you. You're messing up. Not, not any other people. You know, not any other people. So, uh, again, like I said, that's on you. Uh, let's keep going. Black philosophy, a concept of the thinking of a segment of the black minority that makes up more than one-tenth of the entire population of the United States of America. An attempt to deal with their problem from the African heritage and history that developed in a very hostile white America with a white philosophy, white philosophy that finds itself embedded into the Judeo-Christian religions and the educational system that claims a Greek origin. So, like, like, you see, he's like, yo, look, this is just an American thing. Race, an anthropological word that originally depicted the differences in species, which has come to mean the differences between peoples of different physical characteristics, color, and even nationalities, such as the Italian race, Irish race, yellow race, Negro race, white race, etc., ad infinitum, instead of between man and horse, etc., uh, uh, civilized, originally people living in a compact civilly for the benefit of each other, currently meaning those who are of Judeo-Christian Greek-oriented society and control of industrial might, the absence of this being uncivilized. Communism, an economic system of ownership by the entire community as a whole. So this is, uh, this is where communism comes in. Uh, an economic system of ownership by the entire community as a whole, somewhat like the communal system the Africans had before the arrival of the Western European and European Americans that destroyed it. So that's what I would say Dr. Clark is more latched onto. A society sharing in the work and products produced evenly, such as the People's Republic of China, Soviet Union, Re Republic of Yugoslavia, East German Republic, etc. Also, the system of economics put forward in the theories of Frederick Engels and uh, Karl Marx. So, let's see. Yeah. All right. Brainwashed. So, one conditioned to believe in an, anything contrary to his or her own interest. Even made to feel that one is inferior to another or one's history and heritage, culture, etc., is inferior to another, uh, particular to that of a person or persons engaged in the brainwashing process. Okay, so that was interesting. I kind of skipped over that. One condition to believe in another, anything contrary to his or her own interest. So that's when you're brainwashed, when you're, you're, you're conditioned to believe in something that's contrary to your own interest, even made to feel that one is inferior to another or one's history, culture is inferior. So that's interesting. And so he says, see menticide, on page 10. So you know he's going to cite uh, Bobby Wright. Okay, so Cracker, a name for any white person that is similar to a, a, its degrading aspect when blacks are called nigger, etc., et etc., but generally applied to the poor southern whites or so-called white trash, etc. So an intellectual is one who, by virtue of standardized training and experience, is rated by the authority doing said training, a master and or doctor, etc., also done by the intellect requiring or use of that intellect, having a very high degree of intelligence, having superior mental powers to others around and about you, etc. Third world, a member and member nation and their indigenous uh, peoples that experience European, European American, and British imperialism and colonialism since the Berlin Conference of circa 1884 to 1885 and Brussels Conference of circa 1886 to 1896. 
uh, etc., wherein Europeans and European Americans carved up the entire world for their own private property, including its people, mostly of non-white color and not of the Judeo-Christian religions, Judaism and Christianity, etc. So let's see what uh, Affirmatic wrote. Uh, Clark was more of a Garvey than the black capitalist posing as nationalist today, aka Franchi. Yeah, well, I mean, this is this is by Dr. Ben's standard. So this is this is what Dr. Ben said. What was that? You know, so Dr. Ben is, Dr. Ben's like has a different standard from today. You know, and I think he 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 acknowledged that Clark was his 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 great friend. You know, but but he also he also acknowledged that Clark was just like a socialist. Like according to him, like for, to him, like like if you're down with Garveyism like that, uh, like he was, or trained in Garveyism like he was, he 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 he. It's it's like 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 everything is different. Like even. Even today, you know, even today, uh, how you say, oh, like Garvey would be considered a Pan-Africanist, right? But they didn't allow him, like they didn't allow Garvey in the Pan-African conference. You know what I mean? Uh, so, so that that's that's really what I'm uh, that's really what I'm talking about. It's like. Today's standards change, transform. You know, uh, like like even even Malcolm X wouldn't be considered a Garveyite. You get what I'm saying? Like Garveyism would be African nationalism. Uh, it would not be uh, it would not be like Black nationalism. It would not be you know Afro American nationalism. Like like Clark and Ben would would look at it that way. The the only difference is that yeah exactly. See, what I'm saying like like right now. We could say Garveyism is a type of Pan Africanism, but like back then, you wouldn't have called Garveyism a Pan Africanism. You, you know what I'm saying? So like, 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 like the standards have changed. The, the standards have transformed, and and that's just something that you know happened. So here's Pan Africanism actually. So Pan Africanism, the philosophical concept of the struggles to regain cohesion between people of African indigenous origin and their descendants in the so-called diaspora. One whose African nationalism transcends the boundaries of a particular nation within Africa, but sees the entire struggle of African people everywhere as, in fact, one people, etc., in one common struggle, la luta. So this would actually include uh, uh, Garvey, you know? So now, yeah. Uh, so, all right, culture, improvement, development, training and refinement of the mind, etc., but in this context, the historical achievements of the indigenous African people and their descendants elsewhere independent of the European, Asian people, etc. Uh, heritage, all that one accumulates from culture, the heritage of the African Americans, is all that historically belongs to all of the African black people that ever lived, good, bad, or indifferent, etc. Civil rights, those rights and those privileges and rights established by and under law belonging to everyone in society, whether in the Constitution or not. Rhetoric, the art of science, of using words effectively in speaking and or writing so that so as to influence or persuade others to one's own view, totally generally cited in prose, speech, literary composition, etc. Genocide, first applied to the attempted extermination of the European white Jews by Nazi Germany, the systematic killing or extermination of a whole group or nation of people solely because they are different in physical appearance, sex, nationality, religion, color, etc., 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 ad infinitum, cementicide. Revolution, the overthrow of a government, form of government, or social system, replacing it with another. Examples, French Revolution of 1688, American Revolution of 1775, Chinese Revolution of 1911, and the Russian Revolution of 1917, etc. This could be done by total mass force or by undermining from within the Cuban Revolution of 1965. Uh, let's see something. The UPC of Cameroon is called... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the Afri the, they, they play games with, uh, they play games with titles, because, uh, I mean, they do, but, like, like, people after these people put things together, you get what I'm saying? Like, 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 what Bala Ben is saying is, you know, the pure Garveyites, you know, eventually you're gonna have people who are influenced by Garvey, influenced by socialism, influenced by, you know, they're gonna have that, and, and you know, syncretic, uh, syncretic ideologies, but but he's more like like when you say somebody's not a Garveyite, you're more saying this person is not like a pure strain of Garveyism. 
you know, like 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 they're more syncretic, if you will, you know, uh, prophet. In this sense, one who studied the historical events of the past, the present, analyzed them and foretells the possible results of the future without setting a specific date or time when it will materialize. Religiously, religiously one who speaks for God or God as though under some sort of divine guidance or supernatural, etc. Integrate, to make whole or complete by adding or bringing together parts, unify to remove the legal barriers upholding segregation, etc. Conservative, to resist changes irrespective of their value, the maintenance of traditions and institutions for one's own benefit and comfort, which any change will remove, alter. Freedom, relative to movement and thought according to the limits of others, rights in any uh, given society, nation, liberation from the control of someone or thing, uh, etc. Not being restrained by some arbitrary power or force, etc. Diaspora, especially a term adopted uh, from the Jewish people, white, black, yellow, brown, uh, etc. of Asia and Africa, and their scattering from the time of the Babylonian conquest of their homeland, they had seized from the Amalekites, Hittites, etc. Previously, presently, presently used by African, black Americans of the Jewish, Christian, Muslim, uh, Yoruba, Vodou, etc. faiths and economic systems to show their enforced exile in the Western world during slavery and the maintenance of slave conditions mentally and physically still by the power of the European and European American overlords, white power, etc. The root, the root cause of menticide. So a saint. A saint is a person who is extremely meek, charitable, patient, holy, etc. In the traditional sense, in this respect, one who dedicated his or her entire life towards the liberation of African people, etc., the ultimate prize having been martyrdom. Savior or Isatifo, one who protected or saved his people from bondage physically, mentally, spiritually, etc. Uh, Jesus the Christ is a religious example, not the Martin Luther King Jr. being equally, but not in the eyes of those who believe that a saint must be some sort of emissary from God. Uh, Marcus M. Garvey, Malcolm X, The Journal of Truth, Harriet Tubman et al., including Denmark Vesey and Nat Turner, were all saints of the African people in the Western world. All of them tried and did save save their people. Uh, philosophy. Originally the love of wisdom or knowledge, presently the study of the process governing thought and conduct, investigation of principles through theory and laws that regulate them divinely or intellectually in the universe, although including all the students related to logic, physics, laws, ethics, etc. Oh. Uh, imperialist originally a supporter of the Holy Roman Emperor any emperor today the superior supporter of any head of state person in control of power using same for the purpose of exploiting others in a foreign land or locally a prime example in the matter is with European and European American nations and people have colonized nations and peoples in Africa Asia and the Americas etc today is being done as it was by the Firestone rubber company in position on the Republic of Liberia West Africa and its indigenous population in order to exploit their natural resources without control and proper remuneration to the workers etc the true owners colonialism uh, so colonialism, a system by which one country maintains foreign colonies for their economic and human exploitation, generally through the force of arms and religious brainwashing, through what we have come to know as the missionaries of the one and only true God, the Godhead uh, varies according to the colonizer. Indigenous, native of the soil, born, growing, or product of a particular nation, continent, etc., uh, so that's what indigenous would mean. Liberal, one who has tolerance to others' views as well as open mindedness to any idea that challenges tradition or any established order, etc., institution, etc. So there are like white people who are liberals and conservatives, obviously. Al Kabulan, the original name of the continent and Greeks, the Greeks name, renamed Africa. See page 40 of volume 1 for a map and other names of the continent. This is the name the ancient Ethiopians and Moors used. Many African blacks use Africa instead. So, uh, like, this is important because people be always ask, where did he get this Al Kabulan thing? So, you know, I guess when we reach page 40, he's going to tell us. Activist, one who constantly is in state of motion politically, forceful person, a political doer, also applied to other areas where motion is uh, required. Propaganda, originally the congregation for propagating the faith, uh, Christianity. In this sense, any person, group, or organization working for the propagation of particular ideas, doctrine, practices relative to a way of life indoctrination deliberately also using a direct derogatory form or sense connotating deception and or distortion so propaganda is something that we should be, as a black people be very active in and we're not active enough in meant to cite a destruction of the mind a term created by dr bobby e wright or dr bobby wright a psychologist black people's mind 
by making them hate themselves, culture, history, and heritage. Negro, the word is distorted to the extent that practically any two dictionaries will give almost completely different derogatory meanings. Uh, originally created and used by the Portuguese colonialists and imperialists depicting an area on the West African coastline that was in fact ancient Shanghai before Malay and even before that the, greater, the greatest West African empire known as Ghana. Thus the Portuguese so-called Negro land is shown on the map on page uh, 12 and page 13. Equally, the empires that existed there. See Richard B. Moore, the word Negro, its origin and evil uses, New York, 1961, for a complete and definite analysis of the historical origin and development of the white racist nomenclature. Right? And uh, so what's interesting is that, you know, Jay Rogers would tell you that Negro is actually our word. Uh, that Negro is um, from, uh, like, people of the Niger River. So it's like, it's just derived, it's, it's derived from the Niger River, and it's just saying that. You know, people of the Great River Niger would be a Negro. Uh, but anyway, colored and colored originally uses a person of African origin. I usually used to a person of African origin by Frederick Douglass when he broke with other members of the African Colonization Society following his marriage to his second wife, a white woman, his first being black. At the time, questioning his racial classification as being black and or Negro, even though he was obviously of African and European parentage like almost anyone else in slavery. So... So, I don't know, I, I don't even know this, but apparently he's saying Frederick Douglass is where the color <laughs> term comes from. I don't know if that's true, but, uh, you know, and I guess people were just like, wait, why are you being called black? Why are you being called a Negro if clearly you have two different, you know, that he went and got a white woman and said, look, I'm not even black. I'm colored, right? But that's interesting. So, frame up, a colloquial term designed to portray a person placed under arrest, indictment, and or trial for something he or she did not do or even had knowledge of. Uh, Egyptologist, one who studies the artifacts, documents, etc. of the ancient blacks, uh, ancient Africans, blacks of the entire Nile Valley, blue and white, that reached their uh, zenith and high culture civilization at the Delta called Tameri, which is Kemet, obviously, Kant, Sais, Egypt, etc., and tries to place them into a comprehensive whole that more often than not ignores the fact that Egypt and the Africans of Egypt were not isolated from all the others along the entire length and breadth of said high culture that began around the Great Lakes region more than 4,100 miles away to the south at the beginning of the Nile where the god Happy came from. Umwanza Nyanza, the so-called Lake Victoria, at the Mountain of the Moon, Kilimanjaro in Kiswahili. So that's where I want to go. I want to, I want to go to Kilimanjaro. So, you know, if anybody wants to meet me on the top, let me know. All right, so see the words of the Africans of Egypt for their own historical work dealing with this, with their own origin from the South. So an Africanist is a new term by European and European-American academics, academicians who claim a much right claim as much right to be considered an authority of kind equivalent to blacks, a condition where the, whilst they would not equally acquiesce to blacks with respect to Europe, yet they are the ones who still at the present time write most of the books we use in almost all the courses dealing with black studies, African studies, etc. So you see he kind of underlines things. You see he kind of, you know, cap locks. You know, it's, just, it's an interesting writing style. Uh, I mean, it's not really an interesting writing style, but, you know, it is what it is. All right, primitive. Originally the first of anything, today used derogatory, derogatively in order to impugn contempt and inferiority, thus the primitive natives, etc. We have forgotten that everything or person came from a beginning thing or person. See Mendesite. Uncivilized, the opposite of everything said with respect to civilized, on page 8 of this glossary, generally used only to people of African origin, Asian origin, but hardly... Oh, the people of European and European American white origin. So a fossil is originally any rock or mineral dug out of the earth, thus hardened remains of traces of plant life or animal of previous geological era of something preserved in rock formations in the earth's crust. Caucasian, a person that originated at the foothills of the Caucasus mountain range between Europe and Asia, generally white in the United States of America. This word has come from the German anthropologist by the name of Johann Blumenbach in circa 1975. So I think that's the wrong year. It's obviously the wrong year. It probably is not 1975, probably 1775 or 1875, I don't know, but it's not 1975, which he called the so-called mythical Indo-Europeans, etc. Semitic, like, or of the Semites, originally a language group of people, today treated as if it is a racial designation, 
People with large, pointed, hooked nose, kinky hair, light brownish hair, all of which stems from the mythical Jewish character called... So this is a map. This is a map. It's, it's on the side. It's on the side. But you can kind of read it. It says, Negro land on this map highlights the usual distortion of Africa's geography. It is representative of the Europeans' attempt to author authorities on Africa and its people. Though they were not knowing knowledgeable at most of the continent's landmass of cultural groupings note the data of the following page uh, for actual African nations kingdoms and empires that existed in the area before and during the arrival of the Portuguese colonists to West al uh, Africa circled 1430 so you can see right here on the map it says Negro land right here this would be Negro land and I mean the Niger River is, I, I believe right here maybe. I think yeah, it's the Niger River right here. So that's the Niger, and then this would be the Nile right here. And the Nile is considered the longest river in the world. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, so here's this. Just imagine the white man renamed the cross-hatched area below Negro Land as the indigenous people Negroes, and the indigenous people Negroes. So he called this Negro Land. These are the great African, the greatest of the African West African empires, Ghana, Mele, or Mali, and Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai. And, you know, we heard about Mali today. So the Ghanaian Empire was established between 50, to, to 50 BCE to 100 CE. Uh, the exact time is debated daily. However, there are sufficient fossils and artifacts unearthed in the area to concretize the fact that it was in existence before the Christian era. Take note of the Roman traveler who reached the Niger River and Lake Chad area about as early as 50 BCE and those who arrived later. Ancient Ghana was destroyed by the Almoravids around 1076 CE, so that's the Muslims. Uh, they had destroyed the capital, Jene, or Ghana City, earlier in 1070 CE. The Mali Kingdom, which was under the Ghana Empire, was established by Sunjata, uh, Marijata, in 1230 CE. The Mali Kingdom became an empire under Sunjata in 1238 CE. The Mali Mele Empire ended in 1390 CE when it was attacked and invaded by Tuaregs from the north. Mansa Musa II was king at the destruction of Mali. Uh, and Mansa Musa, uh, well, one of them, I don't know if it's the first or the second one, they gave away a bunch of gold in uh, Egypt. All right, so the Shanghai uh, Kingdom was established in 1464 CE by Sunni Ali Burr. The Shanghai Kingdom became an empire in 1488 CE under Sunni Ali Burr. The former Ali Cologne. Uh, eight, the Sangha Empire was destroyed in 1592 CE by African Moors from the north. The invasion from Mauritania, Morocco's original empire, started in 1582 circa, and CE at the end of King Askia Ishak II's reign. So Tombot or Timbuktu, Timbuktu, Tombuktu was the capital city of the Mali Kingdom and Empire. It's the same area before stood the capital city of Ghana named Jene. Here, the first successful operation of a cataract on a human eye was performed by indigenous Amer African physicians, doctors, not so-called medicine men. They were equally Kombi and Kumbi Sele, the original, the religious and commercial capitals of ancient Ghana. So, and then you could, you could read this in Black Man of the Nile and his family. So Shem in the story of Noah and his three sons. Hamidic, the same as Shem, but the youngest of the three sons of Noah. No, no, I, I think Ham, 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 I thought Ham was the oldest, but all right. Uh, the youngest of the three sons of Noah. Uh, see the story of the great flood in the in the in the Bible or whatever. Uh, Nilotic, allegedly a race of people along the Nile River bank who are in no way related to the rest of the indigenous people of Al Kabbalan amongst and around them. This is an author. This is another of the series of racial classifications of Africans north and south of the Sahara by the white liberal Africanist authorities in white academia. Caucasoid, almost Caucasian, but not totally. Another of the sacred cow myths propagated by the Africanists in order to remove every trace of their so-called Negroes and or of the Bantus from all of North and East Africa's history and heritage. All of this is to make it appear European and European-American white people are North Africans. Negroi, the same as the Caucasoid with the main base being Negro, etc. See my side. Paleontologist, a geologist who deals with prehistoric form of life through the study of plants and fossils. Neocene, a period related to the play the Pleistocene, uh, first period of the Quaternary era, two million years before uh, BC. Uh, Australopithecus, a uh, man of the Lake Chad region of Central Africa, or the of the Middle uh, 
Pleistocene period, first of prime state uh, stage, etc. Paranthropus, a genus of Australopithecus, Aus right, whatever. Generally called, you get it, you get it. It's the biggest, you know, it's just a bunch of Latin. Uh, hominids, upright walking, tool making members of the family Hominidae. Homo erectus, alternative name for Pithecarus erectus, example Java man. Pygmy, correctly Hutu and or Twa people of Central Africa, dated back to prehistoric times. Uh, primordial man, the same as earliest of primitive primitive man, uh, used by Dr. A. Churchward. Zin Zinjathropus boise, uh, fossil man unearthed on July 17th, 1959, by doctors Lewis and Mary Leakey in Tanganyika, Aldave Gorge, among the first of the tool making hominids, uh, supposedly man's closest prehistoric relative to date. So, this is some this is some skulls or something. So, this is a reconstruction of a Stone Age indigenous skull. South African lived the same period as the artist who made the carving above. Uh, this is the carving right here, top, the elegance of the prehistoric African art unearthed in South Africa was approximately 30,000 years ago. The prehistoric indigenous Africans. Prehistoric era of Africa was continuous, as one can readily see in the following statement, 10,000 BCE, a Grimaldi, indigenous South African sculptor in Manatape carved the first known statue of a human body. Europeans misnamed it Venus of Willendorf, is confiscated from Africa and placed in the Museum of Vienna, Austria. The glossary is designed to give standard dictionary translations and interpretations, but also quickly used whenever necessary. Thus the new word, menticide, by Dr. Wright. So, that was it. That was the glossary. Let's go. Let's get it. So the purpose. So, even after his death, the black Negro intellectuals feared Marcus Messiah Garvey's name. Let us all examine what some of them, some of them had to say, because and why because their ghosts are back. Marcus Garvey dies at his defeatist program and his as his defeatist program is replaced by a fighting Negro liberation movement against imperialism. So this was somebody named Ben Davis, a top string communist party member. So a communist in the nineteen forties says Marcus Garvey dies as we're trying to you know? Alright, commenting on the Honorable Marcus Garvey following news of his death in London, England of ni June nineteen forty uh, June 10, 1940, the New York Daily Worker, original propaganda publication, June 14, 1940. A Jamaican Negro of unmixed stock, squat, stocky, fat, and sleek, with protruding jaws and heavy jowls, uh, small but bright pig-like eyes and rather bulldog-like face, boastful, this is hard to read, <laughs> boastful, egotistic, tyrannical, intolerant, cunning, shift, smooth and suave, Avaricious, gifted at self-advertisement, without shame and self-laudation, without regard for veracity, a lover of pomp and tawdry finery and garish display, right? So, yeah, I thought this was Du Bois saying this, but no, it's uh, Dr. Robert W. Bagnall in a discourse he called The Madness of Marcus Garvey, in which he also referred to Garvey as a sheer opportunist and demagogic charlatan. I'm going to say this, though, gifted at self-advertisement without a shame and self-laudation, like me and Garvey have something in common, right? No, okay. <laughs> That's me being uh, self lauding actually. All right, uh, tough crowd, tough crowd. No, no, no laugh. Nobody, nobody laugh. Okay. All right. Uh, this <laughs> this anti West Indian ethnic slur was carried in volume number uh, V six thirty eight of the Messenger magazine, which was so called published by the late Chandler Owen and A Randolph Phillip, both right. of them equally uh, enemies of Garvey. Marcus Garvey is, without doubt, the most dangerous enemy of the Negro race in America and the world. He is a lunatic and a traitor. This is Du Bois writing in The Crisis, propaganda mouthpiece of the NLACP, pages 8 to 9, under the heading, A Lunatic or a Traitor. Uh, we have today no enmity against Marcus Garvey. He has a great and worthy dream. We wish him well. He is free. He has a following. He still has a chance to carry on his work in his own home and among his own people and to accomplish some of his ideals. Let him do it. He will be the first to applaud any success that he may have. So this is Du Bois in an editorial early, early in 1928 after Garvey had been deported back to his native Jamaica. This was published under the heading Marcus Garvey and the NAACP. Crisis volume, uh, page 51. Now, you see what I'm saying? Like, here's Du Bois saying, go back to your home. Go do it wherever you need to do it. And ironically, you know, he's pretty much, like, kicked out of America himself. But but the whole thing is that, you know, like, like we talk about 
solidarity or like why doesn't anybody help us why doesn't anybody help us here but here's what happened they tore him up and threw him out and we kind of just like sat by it you know uh but right. thus we see that uh garvey's west indian origin was as much a part of the hatred directed against him by his fellow africans in the united states of america you see what i'm saying probably more than their fear of this back to africa program sadly enough the anti-west indian and anti-american black negro sentiments are again on the war path are again on the war path and he's not talking about 2020 he's not talking about ados he's talking about it just keeps returning it keeps recurring this anti-west indian anti uh uh you know anti-african uh sentiment that just keeps coming back it's like it's 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 ugly, but it, it's just, it's here. But let's go. All covered under the Du Bois versus Garvey black intellectual ultra Marxist debate of late. Yet the, and look, this is a traitor to whom, Du Bois, the colored intellectual, talented end, and the LCP. Who's he a traitor to? Come on. All right. Yet the uh, hypocrisy in the above set the tone for the current two faced attack on the present followers of Marcus Messiah Garvey's philosophy and opinion, in spite of the fact that what happened to Du Bois following what Garvey warned him to guard against, Garvey having asked at that time, Fundamentally, what racial difference is there between a white communist, Republican, or Democrat? Garvey was taking stock of the following quotation from the President of the United States of America, Warren G. Harding, in a speech on race relations before his fellow white Americans of every religion, economic status, political identification, European origin, etc., during October 1921 at Birmingham, Alabama, while quoting from the master racist Lothrop S. Stoddard, The Rising Tide of Color Against the White World Supremacy, New York, 1930. There shall be recognition of the absolute divergence in things social and racial. Men of both races may well stand uncompromisingly against every suggestion of social equality. Racial amalgamation there cannot be. You see? Uh, racial amalgamation. Sorry, amalgamation. You know, sometimes you just, you don't read things, you just say it, you know? Uh, but amalgamation. So, Garvey's saying, look, or it might be Garvey, it might be somebody else, but uh, the idea is that you you cannot you don't want racial amalgamation. If you're a minority population, you do not want racial amalgamation because once you get racial amalgamation, your people are gonna fade away. You know what I mean? So like my complexion, lighter, lighter, lighter until it, till till like like if 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 somebody of anybody's complexion, after let's say four generations of of breeding with white, the child's gonna look white. It's gonna clean them up. This was reported in the New York Times, October 17, 1921, but it took a man like the late Dr. Ralph Bunch, Undersecretary of the United Nations Organization, to place Marcus Garvey's objective in another perspective of degradation, thus the following. When the curtain dropped on the Garvey theatricals, the black man of America was exactly where Garvey had found him, though a little sadder, perhaps a bit poorer, if not wiser. You know? See, Dr. Ralph Bunch's programs, ideologies, tactics, and achievements, page 412, comments in Gunnar Murdahl's American Dilemma, page 748, etc. Yet it was not at all localized in terms of the African American against Garvey because he was a West Indian, as other West Indians found it necessary to equally attack Garvey from their Marxist position, each having to shut his or her eyes to the ethnocentric attacks. But the following from a fellow Jamaican old line Marxist who was later to be thrown out of the party, the poet and political satirist Claude McKay, right? Claude McKay, cited a negative note for a positive conclusion. Thus, a West Indian charlatan came to this country full of antiquity, antiquated, antiquated ideas, yet within a decade he aroused the social consciousness of the Negro masses more than any leader ever did, you know? So, I mean, Claude McKay is the one who wrote uh, If We Must Die, you know, which is an excellent poem that really, you know, like it even inspired me, like, years later, so, you know. But you see, you see it. He called, he called Marcus Garvey a charlatan, and it's like, no, you know? But taken from Claude McKay's A Long Way Home from page 354, in its positive sense, this aided in the downfall of McKay amongst his fellow old left Marxists and NLAC stalwarts who could read the double effect. This man who had written the following equally had to... Hold on a second. Let me make this a little bit smaller so I can uh, fit. Let's see. All right. Equally had to suffer. If we must die, let it not be like hogs. Hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark those mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lap. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain, that even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. 
O oh, kinsmen, we must meet this common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows, deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Now, I'm just curious why this brother, he, he always writes things after. It's, it's just it's a weird way to write. But alright, the man of the people whom Dr. Oh, this is if he must die. So, uh, the man of the people whom Dr. William E. B. Du Bois found necessary to call a little black fat man, ugly but with intelligent eyes and a big head, etc., was to be dead and gone before he could hear the same Dr. Du Bois saying the following, which we, which, words which he recorded on page 277 of his own book, Dusk of Dawn. It was a grandiose and bombastic scheme, utterly impractical, impractical as a whole, but it was sincere and had some practical features. And Garvey proved not only an astonishing popular leader, but a master of propaganda. Within a few years, news of his movement, of his promises and plans, reached Europe and Asia and penetrated every corner of Africa. Like this is this is the real traitor, sh you know? Like this guy sold Firestone. He sold the rubber plant, the rubber plantations in Liberia to Firestone. Sabotaged Garvey's movement, and now after he's dead, he's he's gonna write this stuff. Oh, he was a, he, you know it was a practical thing. And his mask, like, come on. All right. The above is from the one man who most feared Garvey than any other colored man of the era, when Garvey was still struggling to defeat white imperialism in the continent of Africa, while having to fight on the home front old whites and old blacks, Negroes and other coloreds, and the Communist Party of the United States of America, as shown in the following extract from the New York Daily Worker, June 14, 1940, by the late Ben Davis Jr., the real blow to Garveyism was given by the Communist Party. Right, and so that's really this is what I'm saying, like the Communist Party, because that's another thing. Like you go back to uh, Dr. Clark, like I, I'm pretty sure he was in the Communist Party. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure he was in the Communist Party. So it's like it, it there was a rivalry, there was a tension between, you know, as you see the title of the book, Black, black Marxists versus Black Nationals. There's a, there's a tension between them, and uh, you know that's what I'm going to do. But the late Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, father of modern Ghana and master Pan Africanist, said it quite beautifully on page 45 of his book, Autobiography of Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, uh, I thought that of all the literature that I studied, the book that did more than any other to fire my enthusiasm was the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. And remember that the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey was written, I mean, what was compiled by his wife, uh, Amy Jacks Garvey. So note that it is not Garvey who is being weighed in the balance of the world's judgment, but his race, and particularly his jealous and worthy rivals who conspired against him. So this was in the preface of the original Marcus, philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, which was published while Garvey was alive. Uh, white and black will learn to respect each other when they cease to be active competitors in the same country for the same things in politics and society. So is this book necessary? This would be a logical question for anyone who is not aware of the struggle developing once more among blacks following the Marxist socialist theory of economics versus the Hamiltonian African nationalist capitalist theory of economics, each group believing their truth alone is without any doubt at all. So, I mean, just to point out, just a shout out to Afromech, Afromech is uh, a, a scholar par excellence in Garveyism, and of course he would reason that Garveyism was socialist Marxist, but, you know, this is, we're just reading Dr. Ben's words right here. So, so I mean, again, like, capitalist is a strong word, because, I, I mean, Garvey obviously was anti-capitalist, and I think that's something that we have to, as a people, I don't know why I keep looking at the screen, uh, that's something that we have to, as a people, you know, understand that you could be anti-capitalist and not socialist. You get what I'm saying? Like, like capitalism and socialism as a as a dichotomy is not is not it's like an artificial dichotomy. And, and the thing is that white people always do that with us. They always set up basic, simple dichotomies that they say, "Oh, you only have two choices." You know, whether it's Democrat, Republican, whether it's you're gay or straight, whether it's your, uh, you know, oh, you're a socialist or uh, thing. You know, or another dichotomy would be, uh, oh yeah, black or white, or um, you know, like, like a lot of, oh yeah, like Du Bois or Garvey, or Du Bois or Booker T. Washington. You know, there's never there's never a third option. Or Malcolm X and Martha King Jr. You know, it's there's always, there's two things in front of you. You know, pick one. You know what I mean? Oh, don't, don't pick that one. Don't pick that one. Pick that one. You know, it's 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 always like a very simplistic narrative. So, like, it, it's, it's, it's not really capitalism or socialism. You know, although a lot of our people do believe it is capitalism or socialism. It's not just capitalism or socialism. So I would not say Garvey's like a capitalist capitalist in the sense of he's not promote. He's an anti-cap. He doesn't like the bourgeoisie. He doesn't like the white bourgeoisie. 
but he believes in uh, black and like black people being independent of white people, you know. And see, the thing with socialism is that just like capitalism, it's it it's, it deals with white people. Socialism deals with white people too, you know. And 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 you know, you know. I mean, if if Afromac wants to, you know, we we could actually discuss like the the pitfalls of of this white socialism and how it how it takes from the uh, how it takes from the thing. Yeah, like the U.S. elections, exactly. Uh, the one and only salvation for black people anywhere and everywhere. But those of us black African people who witnessed the first round of destruction of the first victims of both sides. Uh, the one and only salvation for black people. Yeah, everywhere, everywhere. For those of us black people who witnessed the first round of destruction of the first victims on both sides, we are shuddering in awesome fear, knowing too well that this time around the toll of black victims of cultural and physical genocide will be that much more devastating in terms of quality and quantity, and the victor will still remain the white slave masters who run both. Here we, have we African people not learned. When we look at what happened to Marcus Garvey, well, W.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, Ben Davis Jr., Adam Clayton Powell Jr., etc., as individuals in the Black Panthers, Revolutionary Action, Action Movement, RAM, the Black Liberation Mar Army, and many other so-called militant black proletarian movements that evolved out of the frustration of the feelings of helplessness in the black so-called Negro ghettos of America, and re-examine the role the so-called militant white proletarian played in diverting the black militant proletarian's original goals for black survival into their so-called new left intellectual pseudo-Marxist dialectics that even made the Black Panthers drop their direct contact for feeding uh, the undernourished black children in the black communities throughout the United States of America and instead take up an oral militancy that resulted in scores of them killed, forced underground, or exiled in so-called Marxist socialist countries that have never once welcomed them with the open arms that, that they had believed would have been the case. You, so you, you understand what, what he just said right here? He's saying, look, you know, these Marxists distract you. You know, at one point, you know, like if your goal was black survival, okay? Your goal was black survival. They distracted you from, you know, feeding people, feeding other Norse children to this oral militancy. And this oral militancy was like straight up criminal by the, by the, by the, by the government standard. And the government in turn killed them, forced them on the ground, exiled them, right? And, 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 and of course we celebrate them, you know, like just the other day, like everybody, like for the, this month is Black August. People are like, yo, look at this George Jackson, letters from George Jackson. The guy is in prison and killed in prison, you know, and he has some good thoughts of so on and so forth, but you, you have to understand that, you know, just feeding your people wasn't criminal, you know, planning an insurrection against the country that you're in was the criminal act, you know, and, and the idea that the government wouldn't do anything about it is like, like, why would you even think that a government would not do anything about it, you know, it's like we have this coup in uh, Mali, you know, uh, uh, the, the assumption that the government wouldn't, wouldn't like, in Mali, okay, maybe you might say, hey, they, the government didn't do anything about it. And now where's the government? You know, where's the president? You know, like, like you have to understand that uh, these Marxists are, are here to distract you. So this is the more of the socialist Marxism that Garvey would have been opposed to. You know, so it's not to say that he would be a capitalist, per se, as much as, whoa, hold up, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, I don't like these two choices. You know, like my like brother was saying, you know, regarding to the election, and, and, of course, you know, but the difference between the election, obviously, is that, you know, real talk, you get, well, I mean, you, if, if you're going to vote, you know, I mean, you don't have to choose either, but one of them are going to win. When it comes to the capitalists and the, so, the so, Marxists, unfortunately, the capitalist is winning. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if you, oh, I'm a communist, or blah, blah, the capitalist is winning, and everybody knows it. Uh, and, it and it's unlikely that the capitalist won't win. Uh, and that's what Gary was saying. He's like, look, if you guys do win, we're all for you. But, uh, if you, but, like, we're not going to be your fighter. We're not going to be your cannon fighter. You know? Like, if you win, that's good. But, but even, what's his name said, uh, uh, what's his name? Carter G. Woodson said, look, if a people do not, if a people are not organized, it doesn't matter who wins. Because the, 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 the person who wins is going to be in charge. Like, like, like in Mali, it doesn't matter if the people were all on the streets, you know? The person in charge is the guy with the freaking tanks. You understand? You know, uh, you know, the guy who, you know, actually, I'm not going to say nothing about him, but, you know, just in case he wants to offer me a job. Uh, <laughs> you know, I got to go where the money's at. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, tough crowd. Nobody left? Nobody? Nothing? All right. Uh, <laughs> somebody do LOL? Nobody? LOL. LOL. No? Okay. 
uh, would blah, blah, blah. This book becomes that much more necessary for our learning uh, process, but it equally becomes very dangerous to those who would prefer to ignore the major double cross they and their forebears suffered as a direct result of the so called old and new left black and white alliance and so called colored talented tenth intellectuals once espoused. You know, and I mean, this is the thing though, like all these socialists, you're going to see a black and white alliance and all these socialists pretty much, you know? Uh, and, and like, even like you said, like, like, like brother was pointing out Niere and, uh, and all that. Uh, Niere, wait, who else you put? And Kruma. Yeah, you see with Niere and, and Kruma, this guy. All right. <laughs> you see this black white alliance too, you know? You see this black white alliance where Nkrumah obviously marries a freaking white woman. Or, well, I mean, you know, it depends on how you look at it, to be honest. Because, you know, when you look at her, she just kind of looks, like, she doesn't look like whatever. But, but then when, when, when it comes to Nyere, you know, he's engaging with this wider banking community. He's taking out loans, and he's, uh, he's inviting white folk and all that stuff. You see what I'm saying? He got it. This guy got it. <laughs> and Power got it. Asante Sana. I'm saying Asante Sana. <laughs> see what I'm saying? I got, I got, I got, I got, I got, I got, LOL. You know, we doing it. Oh, by the way, you guys don't forget to like. Don't forget to like. You know. Uh, all right. So where are we at? Uh, so politically, oh yeah. So a proposition by Du Bois in which one t one tenth of the Negro talented tenth would be responsible to the government for overseeing everything for the other ninety percent. You know, responsible to the government. But I mean, it's, it makes sense. You got to realize that a lot of times when uh, <laughs> donations. <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh yeah, so, oh yeah, I, I mean, I got a new donation system, uh, I got a new donation system, so, it's, it's a new donation system, you can get one of those quote books for 10, bo for 10, I'm oh, sorry, for 10 dollars, and I'll, I'll give the, de I'll give the details tomorrow, uh, I'll give the details tomorrow, well, basically, it's like, you know, if you want to, if you want to donate, you can. And it's just going to be, uh, it's just going to be like you get a little book and you can give out the book. Because the book's free. The book's free, so you're really just donating, you know. Uh, but, like, the main thing is that the main purpose is that you want to do propaganda. And, I mean, the book is also free. Like, you can go on Discord and you just click on the link of Discord, join the Discord, and, and, and you get all the books already for free. You know, even this book other books because you see it's all on google drive so you're just gonna get access to the google drive you get the books and that's it but like if you want to donate you know you can also just buy the paperback and then with that paperback you can just give it away because you already have the book on ebook uh or you can keep it uh politically this book is extremely critical if not for other reasons that is contemporary nature and due to its highly controversial question and issues thus it is to be expected that the so-called new left black marxist intellectuals must also label it red baiting and our black chauvinism their past performances in the 1930s to 1950s, which ended the beginning of the so-called Black Power Movement of the middle 1960s CE, having proven to be no better than the 1940s CE following World War II, when the parents of the so-called white new Marxist intellectuals were the ones that misdirected the so-called militant civil rights political protest movement of said period and thus frustrated our aspirations as very young blacks at the time colored and Negroes will therefore remain in the same white racist framework, whether it is called the old left, new left, center, etc., of the American system of democracy, politically, economically, socially, religious, ad infinitum. Yet we black people seem to not have learned anything from these experiences. Why? Dr. Robbie Wright defined it as menticide, the result of mental slavery. But like real talk, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it to you straight. The trouble is that you don't have any damn schools. You don't have any schools. You're not gonna learn anything. You are not gonna learn without like you're not gonna have a broad based education without a broad based educational system. Okay, if you don't have an educational system telling you stay away from the left because of what they've done to us in the past and you break it down, you can't expect people to not be curious, like to like like when they go to these white schools where it's like, oh no, don't investigate communism. Communists, we don't like communists. Communists are our enemy. They're trying, you know, like the white person is just giving you these communists to go look and get distracted from, right? Like you're going to look into it. You're going to look into it. So it's just, it's just... You have to have your own school, your own education system. That's why I always stress, Boko Waset Nakeru. If you do not have these school systems, then, like, don't, like, you can't complain about what's going on. It's like Garvey said, if you do not, uh, 
if you do not teach somebody, you cannot hold them accountable. You you no, you can't later say that they're accountable to something because you didn't, you never taught them. So so if you're not teaching people, you can't just say, oh well, it's menticide, it's mental slave. No, it's it's a lack of schooling. You legit do not know your history because you weren't taught it in any formalized setting. And and that's where I'm going to tell you, Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark dropped the ball because they both went to uh, formalized. They went both went to institutions where they learned history, you know, by Arthur Schomburg and, and you know, that, that industry, that, that, that environment. So they both went through that kind of thing, but they did not set up one. You know, so I couldn't have studied under him. You know, any, nobody else could have studied under them. So that, that's really one of the, uh, it's really one of the things that we have to understand as a people that you have to set up educational points. Otherwise, you know, you know, what are you doing? So let's go. Now the focal point of the so-called Black power movement of the 1960s has been redirected. We, all of us, can realize that this had to be as the vast majority of the white militant new left teenagers and other young adults have deserted their so-called black-white militant coalition and returned home for retraining for the takeover of the old left parents' ruthless capitalist business enterprises in the garment city, Diamond, the result of slave labor and genocide in South Africa, uh, and gold center, manufacturing center, etc., etc. Not a single one of which a so-called, a so solitary old or new black left member owned or owned. So, like, after these white militants, these white socialists are all, let's change the system, rah, 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 right? And then they realize that they can't. They go to their big jobs, in the garment center, in diamonds, you know, like, like, and then meanwhile, after you fit it, realize that you, you can't do anything, you're like sitting in prison or something, you know, or you're just going, you know, you're going back to being a janitor, well-spoken janitor, you know, and that's the thing you have to realize too, that these socialists, they have training programs, they have training programs for socialism. I was a, I was a part of one of these uh, socialist organizations where they kept inviting me to be in the upper wing and get groomed to be a socialist leader, you know, and I didn't, I didn't take the bait. But I have a friend who's still there, like, and this was like 10 years ago. She's still there, you know, uh, public speaker, all of that. But it's like, that's what they do. They groom you to be leaders in this thing. But but they, they got money. You don't. So on the other hand, the black Negro militant has returned to the same old position of their parents, being the servants for the white new left, center right, and or whatever else. Yet it would seem that we have not learned one solitary message from this experience as we are now black left intellectuals at war with black right intellectuals. You get what I'm saying? Because of the above brought about by the turning point of the European and European American capitalist colonist wars in formerly so-called French Indochina, also Southeast Asia, the acceptance of certain so-called silent white minority advocates where they could not enter before due to religious bigotry, nationalism, ethnocentrism, and of course the fact that black people no longer accepted to be led by any member of the so-called white minorities, all the former so-called ultra-white cold militants of the black white coalition found it necessary to regroup their forces into lily white new left camps as their fellow white right racial silent majority of so-called god-fearing christian america began their new method of suppression under the banner of fighting crime in the streets the most not modern nomenclature for stopping the niggers etc my observation above with will not suit the new and or old black nationalists any more than the new or old, old, and our all black Marxists, simply because I tried to be understanding of the issue on both sides of the argument, as many still continue seeing such a falling into the hands of the communists, the other side seeing it as being an arch dupe of the capitalist pigs, which all will associate with my being some sort of confused cultural African nationalist, and worse yet, my attempt at seeing W. Du Bois in any way loving African African people, with as intensive a feeling as Marcus Garvey, will certainly earn me the turncoat of the century award. Yes. That did. That did. Wow. You think W. B. Du Bois? Nah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I don't. I don't want to read this right now. <laughs> like, one man said, Du Bois, the freaking traitor, loves Africa. Oh my gosh. All right. Let's let's go through. I just gotta catch my breath, right? That was that was a lot. All right, but well, this is the purpose of my book: to try and bring a sense of sanity between those of us who prefer the approach to African nationalism and Pan African nationalism, otherwise called Pan Africanism, through a totally black program, and those of us who prefer Pan African Africanism through the efforts of aid from disenfranchised and suppressed whites of the labor forces in the United States of America, who do not share directly in the profits made by ruthless colonialism, imperialism, and neocolonialism, and of course, not excluding any other group of blacks. So you see, like that's really the difference between it. It's like one group is about Pan Africanism through a black program, 
and the other is about well we could probably get some help from these white folks you know but the thing is this the trouble is that it's so centered in america in america you're you lost that's why i don't even i don't even mess with america it's like you lost in america there's no like like they can they can make anything illegal they, they control the laws like like come on this work also cites the so-called black church as an institution of solid strength in the black community and still survives today. It also sees the same black church, not necessarily meaning that which is Christian alone, but of Jewish, Muslim, Yoruba, Voodoo, etc. Parts being of a major focal point of black survival, along with other black institutions, which continues to believe in the redeeming grace like it once had and commanded before and after the so-called emancipation of the Reconstruction era through, through such leaders as the reverends Nat Turner, Richard Allen, Denmark Vasey, Absalon Jones, High Highland Garner, uh, High, Henry Highland Garner, etc., as well as lay members like Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington. Thus, it is what I hope would cope our contemporary leaders in the black church can visualize that there is a crying need for a black God. Netcher, I should use Netcher for now, but alright, I'll try to. What, uh, who had and only one aim, one cause, and one destiny. A black nature who sees and speaks in terms of black theology that embraces every vital aspect of black survival in the diaspora here in these United States of America and other parts of North, Central, and South America, equally in the Caribbean islands. Uh, the same as he, she, it, they, uh, nature with our brothers and sisters in our motherland, al the Greeks, uh, the Greeks, Africa, etc., uh, there being no other kind than black, irrespective of the fact that so-called modern white, European, European-American, Semitic, Caucasian, Indo-European, and Africanists have created their uh, Hamites, Nilotes, uh, Negroes, Pygmies, Bantu, Bushmen, women, Hottentot, Negroids, Caucasoids, Semites, Fuzzies, Berbers, etc., ad infinitum for her, black mother, the cradle creation civilization. Lastly, the lack of a common black philosophy for our young blacks makes anything offered them in the line of hope before death and resurrection into heaven, while they are still living on this earth much more meaningful than the constant prayer to a lily white God who's, who seems never to answer their prayers in terms of political, economic, social, and religious freedoms from the modern pharaohs of the major Judeo-Christian Islamic worlds where black people from African origin and birth still suffer in delayed forms of cultural and physical genocide, now, not tomorrow, neither the day after tomorrow, nor in the distant future. This work to me represents another side of the argument I have found to be quite degrading to people of African origin and birth of descent everywhere because of at least the following three reasons. Everything a everything we do must be integrated based on the racial myth of the amalgamationist theory approach furthered by the all men are created equal syndrome uh, B in order to have equality in education We must be sitting next to a member of the white race based on the myth about the genetic inferiority of the Negro race developed by white academia, etc. and the white Bibles uh, with respect to the Genesis story about Noah and his three sons, particularly the youngest Ham, and whose child came black as the result of a curse placed on him by Noah through the Jewish god Yahweh and the same uh, nature of the African Moses. Uh, no, I shouldn't use nature. All right. See, we must love everybody because we are all God's children based upon the Judeo-Christian mystique. Even Jews refuse to practice anywhere on this planet Earth, even in Israel with respect to the black Jews or, Be or Beta Israel. In term, in item C, we can find quite a lot of the ingredients that demand the creation of an all-black God like the all-white God black people are praying to in all-black churches and all-black neighborhoods. As indicative of the teachings we are about to examine, particularly with reference to the our image of ourselves, this will be uh, further emphasized on the following page. There will be seen how man projected himself into that which prefers to call him his God. Since man made and created with his mind that which he calls God, thus he made God in his own image and likeness, etc. So menticide has been the result of black self-hate caused by the Judeo-Christian allegory. All right. So the danger inherent in the three points ABC on the previous page is that we black African people are being led into believing that it's almost criminal or sinful to love our own blackness as all other people love their own respective color and that we are committing an unforgivable sin and our crime believing that our own race must not be integrated into the white race for the sole purpose of being considered pure in heart, cultured, learned, and are even civilized, irrespective of the fact that all of the evidence so far proves that 
mankind originated in Africa, south of the Sahara. In other words, Africans, men, women, and children, were the only original Adam and Eve. Irrespective of the book of Genesis and the Judeo-Christian white racist theology, we can still see any Negro colored church like the following scene. Jesus as an Italian. Okay, The Judeo-Christian Jesus, the Christ depicted as the Good Shepherd, pictured in the statue of blah, blah, blah. Note that the sculpture sculpted his God, Jesus, in his own Italian image and likeness, etc., thus rectifying, the recertifying what your author constantly maintained, God is whatever man made of him or her. In type of religious, type of racism, religious bigotry, and even economic exploitation that produced the picture of the lily white Semitic God had Jesus, the Christ, we have just examined, were developed from the same high culture and people who also distorted the blackness of heaven, uh, netherworld, other world, spirit world, ancestral world, etc., shown below, as extracted from the book of Coming Forth by Day and by Night, translated from the original hieroglyphic text by Sir E. A. W. Budge into English under the title uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Paradise of Ani, London, 1895, and made to appear like the other two scenes. Thus, this is a, thus the Europeanized version. Uh, Ani and his wife watch his heart being weighed against the feather of Ma'at, the divine scribe taught, and the monster Amut at the far right await the verdict. Uh, this is the book of uh, Coming Forth by Day. Osiris presiding over the weighing of the heart, a Europeanized version of the scene above, according to the early European Christians who copied the African religion. So you have, this is a, this is a scene, I mean it's obviously faded out, but you could see that, you know, you have Asar uh, doing the same weighing of the heart. And then you have Michael, the archangel, repels the demons who try to seize the fateful scale of the Last Judgment. Right, so the Africans, Book of the Dead, preceded the Old Testament, uh, and even Adam and Eve, who were around 67 and 36, 3760 BCE. So, what we Black Africans have mixed up in our Judeo-Christian Islamic belief syndrome, depicted in total lily whiteness, we even uh, have carried into the myth an allegory of a malady who have freely given the label racial balancing for purposes of equality education. Uh, but the zenith of the malady is that the only good when the African black child is being bussed into the neighborhoods of European white child never is considered to be racial balancing for, purpose of, for purposes of quality education with the busting in the opposite direction. So nobody's saying, you know, send black kids into the white, no, send white kids into the black neighborhood for equal, for quality education. You know, nobody's saying that. Thus the book, and that's what I like about Dr. Ben too. He like, like he understands the nationalism, you know, or, or better than most, you know. I mean, again, like, if you're in the white nation where all the wealth is concentrated in the whites, you know, it makes a lot of, you know, they're setting the curriculum and all that. It makes a lot of sense why they would represent the quality of education, if you will. But even so, uh, but that's what I'm saying. Like, you just got to get out. Uh, thus, this book shows that the white new left intellectual was always picket for blacks entering schools in white neighborhoods are never on the single picket line doing the same for whites entering schools in black neighborhoods. Why? Because of plain old white Caucasian, Semitic, Indo-European racism and religious bigotry that validates the myth which states, in essence, gene genealogically blacks are inferior to whites. All this should be very common to the so-called Negro color theologians, clergy, and, la and laity and congregations instead of the constant white brainwashing each Sunday morning under the title of Sunday School Lessons, wherein every form of European and European-American so-called holy scriptures are taught in their white racist purist purity all valid in the type of pictures we have just witnessed, uh, witness, but at no time dealing with the blackness that originally covered the black Madonna and child from whence the European and European-American white virgins originated, not even her uh, black son Jesus the Christ, the early European Christians worshipped, both of which I have shown on the following page. And in my reflection, it is also this aspect of the black man's origin and heritage that Marcus Messiah Garvey and Dr. William Edward Bugart Du Bois saw eye to eye an equally acceptable value, the only disagreeing on the methodology and presentation to their fellow African color people, and thus is that black religious leaders, theologians, must be speaking to all of us, black African people, uh, in no matter from an integrationist, amalgamationist posture, where the Hebrew gods, Yahweh, Christian gods, Jesus, the Christ, and Muslims, God, Allah, or all of the other gods we know of as a white man, yellow man, etc., and no other religion is true, all of them being some sort of paganistic, heathenistic, satanic, animistic, etc. sect. Uh, why don't the Marxist intellectuals protest this form of genocide? All right, so so here's Jesus the Christ as sort of the good shepherd in his blackness. 
So in all his blackness, so this is obviously a black and white book, but maybe, maybe it was colored. I don't know. And his blackness, uh, favorite of the early Christians of Europe, when all pictures and statues of Jesus were shown black, right? This was back in the fourth century, okay? Uh, but then you see this is Isis and the infant Horus, right here, and then you have uh, also you have Horus or Heru, uh, right here. Madonna, black Madonna in chief, a Middle Kingdom statue, bronze height, five inches, courtesy of Berlin. Uh, so on and so forth. Tell us which one is true, circa 1978 or circa 4100 BCE. A fact brought to light in the teachings by Professor Hubert Her Harrison of Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. Uh, so I didn't even know Hubert Harrison was in the UNIA. But what is he talking about? Oh. An Immaculate Conception and Virgin Mother. So, so Heru had an Immaculate Conception and a Virgin Mother uh, in 4100 BCE. All right, so... Lastly, no, he got a fro. <laughs> oh yeah, this guy. <laughs> Just got a fro. All right. Uh, lastly, and most importantly, this book debunks the notion that the belief in new old Marxism or new old communism will solve all of our African black problems any more so than the belief in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and even in so-called capitalist free enterprise democracy. Realize neither of these beliefs excludes the need of any aspect of a faith. And another savior god for example there's nothing in capitalism that socialism does not have already and in superior essence that it is godlier etc thus it is godlier etc uh, opposite is true of the fanatic believer and a capitalist of course we are already familiar with the age-old argument that my religion is better than yours anytime so the uh, latter argument kept the african black nations in the diaspora divided against itself from circa 1506 to the present day Thus, it is that this work, equally as its author, intends to be a positive force, reminding all of us, African black people, men, women, and children, that we can differ on either of the beliefs mentioned above, maybe as we did before, but neither should any one of them be allowed to make a single one of us believe that we are equally as well or better off amalgamated with the European race than being separated to our own African race. So I want to say this, though. This is what I didn't like about Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark. Like, like you're going to see that I don't really listen to much of them. The reason why I don't, I, don't, I don't like that is because they talk about religion too much. Like, me, it's like, I don't care about religion. Uh, so, I mean, that was like one of the, that's one of the most difficult things about, like, going through their work is that, oh, a lot of the works of a lot of black people, it's like, you, you just keep, you keep referencing this white boy and you keep going back to this white boy. And it's like, okay, like, a little bit I get, but like, this is like a lot, you know? This is a lot. Um... Alright, so, as if being of African black race is inferior to the European race, uh, to the point of referring to our own youngsters, whenever a solitary one of them becomes anyway unruly, you are the black sheep of the family. You know, uh, so this guy is really not concentrated. He's like, he's pretty easily distracted. Uh, and that's actually, uh, it's interesting. Uh, dang, this is actually a freaking... I thought it was going to be a shorter read. <laughs> the analysis that follows with Dr. Uh, William E. B. Du Bois versus uh, Brother Marcus M. Garvey, the National Association of the African uh, Advancement of Colored People versus the Universal Negro Improvement Association of the African Communities League, Black Christians versus Black Jews, Black Muslims versus Black Christians, etc., should not find a single one of us believing that a solitary side of us is better instead of different than the other, any more so than communism, meaning a socialist economy, is better than democracy, meaning a capitalist economy, solely upon the basis that one white man loves us more than the other white man, for we should observe that the major problem lies solely in the age-old maxim of mine is better than, and mine is better holier than yours and that syndrome we have been brainwashed into believing by our, so, by our white so-called Christian <coughs> missionary teachers who use the Jewish Bible, Old Testament, and their own version of the Christian Bible, New Testament, for their own left, center, and right old and new proselytizing effort to commit cultural physical genocide against us whose ancestors gave gave the world what became the basis for so-called modern technology this being mathematics as demonstrated by the following article extracted from awake like like look how random this is uh this is how look how random this is yeah the religious religion and spiritual system began with us you know this was right uh under the title how did a how does how does africa count so this is page 17 to 19 a foreign traveler a foreigner traveling through the continent of Africa during the 18th century was undoubtedly impressed with the seemingly endless variety of people and cultures. Communication was accomplished by means of numerous highly developed and complex languages, but even more startling perhaps was the fact that the people were good mathematicians. mathematicians. Some of their methods of calculating are still being used today. In the 18th century, the Hausa city of Katsina in northern 
uh, Nigeria, was a center of learning where Muhammad ibn Muhammad specialized in numerology. However, for most of the sub-Saharan tribes, counting was and is simply a part of their way of life. How they count to 20. Consider the Yoruba, Igbo, and Efek language of Nigeria and the Gun language, which is spoken in Dahomey. Each language has its peculiar numbering system, and each system is interesting and practical. Although in the Yoruba, Gun, and Igbo languages, the numerals from 1 to 10 each have individual names, these are many, there are many dissimilarities in their counting method. To a large extent, 20 is the basic unit in both Yoruba and Igbo. On the other hand, 40 is more often used as a base in Gun. In Yoruba and Gun, numerals continue to have individual names up to 15, but then the Yoruba language completes the rest of the terms by subtracting from 20. However, in Gun, this is done by adding to 15. Mm, okay. In counting from 11 to 19, the Igbos add their units to 10, but the Efix have a totally different system, using 5 as their base unit in counting up to 20. Thus, the number 6 in Efix is 5 plus 1, 11 is 10 plus 1, 16 is 15 plus 1, and so on. This means that all the numerals 1 to 5 and 10 and 15, 15 and 20 all have individual names. Beyond 20, each system employs seemingly complicated ways of designing the numeral. A look at each language should prove interesting. Uh, it should be noted, that's why the numerous references. Oh, this uh, it should be obvious that the article above was published before my manuscript was finally ready for press. Does this entry along with that which I have already decided to present on Egypt? Does this correspond realize correspond and realize all of the above was done before the first missionary in Africa came from Europe and our Asia? Okay. As we have already seen, the Yoruba make use of 20 as their basic unit. Thus, the numerals 20, 200, and 400 have individual names. Other decimal units progressing by tens are established by multiplication of 20 or 200 uh, and subtraction of 10 or 100 as required. Thus, 60 is expressed by 320s and 50 is expressed as 320s minus 10. Of course, the expressions designated these numerals are contracted into single words in each case. The intermediate numbers between decimal numbers, decimal figures, are expressed by adding units up to 5 and subtracting units beyond 5. Thus, 24 is expressed as 20 plus 4, while 28 is expressed as 30 minus 2. The number 565 is expressed as 200 times 3 minus 20 times 2 plus 5. In contrast to the Yoruba, the Igbos, the FX, and the tribe that speak Gun do not uh, make use of subtraction expressing their numerals. The Igbo, employing the basic numerals of 20 and 400, establish their large decimal numbers by multiplication and addition. Thus, 50 is expressed as 2 20s plus 10, 20 times, 10, 20 times 2 plus 10, and 300 is expressed as 15 20s, 20 times 15. How would you like trying to express a thousand? It is simply just say, Okay, somebody, I know, I know one of these brothers is uh, Igbo, so just, you know, just, just, just never mind, okay? <laughs> but alright, uh, two four hundreds and, uh, and ten twenties. Uh, or uh, one million is expressed as, Nunu, Nunu, Isi, Na, Ugu, Nunu, Isi, Isi. Alright, uh, four hundred times four hundred times six. Dang! 400 times 400 times 6. <laughs> One more clap. Alright, plus 20 times 400 times 5. Yo, that's crazy. Alright. These expressions are perfectly understood by the Igbo villages. Yo, 400 times 400 times 6? Like, what? I don't even know what... Like, what? I don't even know what that is. Like, uh, yo, brah. Brah. It was good. Anyway. Uh, this, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You gonna say pitiful. Uh, the system employed by the FX is somewhat different. We have already uh, seen that between uh, below 20, 5 is the basic unit. All the decimal numbers that are multiples of 20 up to 100 have the individual names. Okay. Uh, the intermediate decimal numbers are formed by adding 10 to the lower numeral. Thus, 50 is expressed as 40 plus 10. It appears that 100 used to be the highest numeral and has a vernacular name. Figures beyond that were expressed as multiples of 100. Now, however, the word tossin is used to express a thousand, apparently a corrupted corruption of the word thousand. Also, the English word million is used. East African methods, the, Mal the Malagizi, people of the large island of Madagascar, off the east coast of Africa, are thought to have migrated from the Malayan Peninsula more than 2,000 years. Uh, oh, I see, I see. 
Another myth, see underscored words below and check your Kiswahili Kenda based language. Uh, I don't know. My thing is that he just leaves these these footnotes. I don't know where I don't know where the zero is from. Alright, whatever. Uh two thousand more than two thousand years ago. Thus their language is not Malayan origin, their system of counting dates back to the centuries before they left Malaya. In this system all units from one to ten have individual names. Numerals from eleven to nineteen are expressed as ten plus the appropriate units. The decimal Numerals of ninety are expressed as multiples of ten, such as Teliopolo, thirty or three tens. The numerals a hundred Zato, a thousand Arivo and Alina uh, uh, 10,000 10, Alina and 100,000 Hetsi and 1 million Tapis Tira. All, right. all have specific names. Tapi Trisa, Tapi Trisa literally means end of figures. Other decimal numbers are obtained by multiplication as in English, such as Telo Arivo, uh, 3,000 Telo Alina, 30,000 or 3, 10, 10, 10, 10, 3, 3 times 10,000 and Hetsi Tapistra, 100,000 times. One million. Okay, so that would be that's a lot. Uh, the Magalazi uh, people express their numerals backwards, and compound figures can become versatile, ver veritable jawbreakers. Try pronouncing one thousand five hundred sixty-nine seven hundred fifty. Oh, sorry, one million five hundred sixty-nine seven hundred fifty-three in the Magalazi language. I'm actually really hungry, by the way. All right, tello ambi dimampolo ambi fitanzato si civi. Arivo C and Emalina C Dimi Hetsu C Ire Tapitrisa. Okay. Remember that the numerals are expressed backwards, so that is literally meaning three plus fifty plus seven hundred plus nine hundred nine thousand uh plus six times ten thousand plus five times a hundred thousand plus a million. Interesting. On the mainland, the majority of languages spoken in East and Central and South Africa belong to a family of languages that have been given the name Bantu. One of these languages, Swahili, which is reputed to be one of the 12 principal languages of the world, has been modified and affected by other languages such as Arabic. Uh, so we find, for example, that 6, 7, and 9 are designated by Arabic words. All the units and individuals, no, all the units have individual names, and the numerals above 10 are formed by adding the units to 10. 20 and all the other decimal numerals up to 100 have their own names, as does 1,000. Multiples of 100 are expressed by multiplication and addition. Thus, 999 is expressed as Mia Tisa Tisini Na Tisa, literally hundreds, nine, ninety, and nine. Uh, the Chiyanga, uh, so that was the, uh, that was the note, I guess. The Tsinyanga uh, speaking people have specific names for their unit from 1 to 5, and a decimal numerals 10, 100, and 1,000. The other units from 6 to 9 are expressed as 5 plus 1, and so on. The numbers from 11 to 15 are expressed as 10 plus 1, and so on, while 16 to 19 are expressed as 10 plus 5 plus 1, and so on. A system of multiplication and addition is used in establishing the designation for all the large numerals. Thus, 30 is expressed as 10 times 3, and 600 as 5 plus 1 times 100. So people in Malawi have quite a mouthful in saying, for example, 66, which is just malo, makumi asano ndi limazi mfambo asano ndi limozi. Yeah, that's just 66. That's just the number 66. That's crazy. Uh, I don't know why he had this whole thing, but he said it was only two pages, but shit. All right. <laughs> it can readily be appreciated why not only many Sinyanya people, persons, but are... Also, those using other vernacular languages in Africa have adopted the European words for numbers in their everyday speech. So in Nigeria, one can hear a man speaking fluent Efek but using English words for numbers, whereas in neighborhood neighboring Dahomey, Fon-speaking people will often use the French words for numbers. Yeah, I guess that I mean to, to, to the to the white man's credit, he made numbers kind of easy, uh, you know, for himself. Uh, practical systems: the different systems of counting of the tribes in the sub-Saharan. Uh, civilizations have been well suited to their way of life. A further look at the methods employed by the Yoruba of Nigeria will illustrate, illustrate this. Over the centuries, their civilization placed emphasis on trading, and their medium of exchange was the cowrie shell. Buying and selling thus involved the country uh, and exchanging of large quantities of shells. This explains why um, the establishing of numbers by subtraction is preferred in their system. They counted their money by drawing off groups of five shells 
in order to establish heaps of 20s and 200s. Then to arrive at intermediate numbers, they would subtract a few extra ones from the overall total. This minimized the motions involved in counting. Uh, numbers denoting fractions often and f order, sorry, fractions, order, and frequency all have their expression in the sub-Saharan languages. Some tribes made use of suffixes or prefixes in naming such numbers, while others employ completely complete expressions or phrases in order to express the idea. In Swahili expression, kasaroba, one-fourth, is a literal translation, is less a quarter. Uh, one and three-quarters, mbili kasaroba, is literally two less a quarter. In African cities up to up to date systems of currency have replaced the use of cowries and manilas or metal bracelets also once used as a medium of exchange. However, the older complex system are still widely used in the villages, and even those who cannot read or write in any language are able to accomplish impressive feats of mental arithmetic. Yet Africa does count in a wide variety of ways and with real skill. Yeah, cowries were the main currency, not just in West Africa, but continental for longer, understanding. Yeah. I, I I still don't know where these cowrie shells are from though. Like where where are they from? Like are they just found? I mean, cause you know, gold is just found. To be honest, but I, I don't even know what a cowrie shell is. I never, I actually never had one. Uh, pretty shocking. Pretty shocking that somebody in the middle of America would never have a cowrie shell. But you know, I'll say it anyway. Sad, it is indeed that too many of us cannot see that the indigenous black Africans who created and developed all the above did so before there was a Christianity that, be that began in Egypt, North Africa, much less before it distorted conversion into European nationalism by Emperor Constantine the Great of Rome in circa 312 CE, and more so before the birth of Frederick Engels and Karl Marx, etc., and the old and new socialist order. All of this took place... Um, so, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah. All of these took place before there was the first Jehovah's Witness. Why then can we, African black people, not produce another of our own economic system without the white man having to be at the head, thus being, thus being equally true without the yellow man or brown man in the same position? Certainly the same type of pagans, heathens, and their gods also created and developed the following I've extracted from page 206 to 209 of my own book, Black Man of the Nile, a valley all of this before there was a Joshua Christos or Jesus the Christ, born in Asia, brought up and educated in Africa by African theologians who never once set foot on the continent. Uh, I said Washington on the coast. So the continent of the Europe, among the Europeans. Thus, back checked uh, Asian admixtures from Kendall language structure. So, I mean, this is actually, I don't know how this is still the introduction. You know, this is like a long ass introduction, but okay. <laughs> but like, this is a long ass introduction. I don't, I don't understand. All right, so our ancestors created this, but we cannot create our own economic system. So the triangle of the pyramid field, man's earliest numerological and mathematical challenge began. Uh, African trig and math before Pythagoras. And so this is us doing math, and you can see the uh, the writing. is It's like completely unreadable. I was trying to read Metonetra the other day, and it's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. Like, I, I legit do not know what I'm looking at. Uh... Uh, technically, you could tell from how these things are positioned that you're reading from right to left over here, I think. But, like, still, I just don't I just don't even know what I'm looking at. All right. So the above triangle field... Oh, cool. He's going to tell us. Okay. So the above triangular field contains mathematical calculations that solve the area of the trileg or house of Amenita, a pyramid or house of heaven, the netherworld. It was developed in the pre-dynastic era, but the problem was solved in the 4th century BCE, and was uh, during the ending of the 30th dynasty, uh, so 341 BCE. Uh, and I think the 30th dynasty is after it's even black, which is an interesting thing to point out. Uh, because like I think the last black dynasty, the last time black people ruled in ancient Kemet was the 25th dynasty, as far as I remember. Uh, and then like from there forward, that's what I remember. So I don't know why he would actually cite that as an example of uh, black math, but... Uh, although they were just probably copying the earlier dynasty, but still. Uh, like he says, pre-dynastic. So the indigenous Africans of the Nile Valley who came from a point points farther south 
along the Great Lakes region of central Archimulan not only solved the triangle or pyramid field in such an early stage of man's beginning into the reaches of scientific intellect before the original before the origin of Western civilization, Greek society, they also squared this circle by using an equation of the geometric equivalent of eight ninths of the length of the diameter and reached the constant, the sixteenth letter of the alphabet, uh, pi, uh, which corresponds to the <laughs> <laughs> which corresponds to the further modification by the English alphabet P. It is a symbol which designates the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter of 3.14159265. The Nile Valley Africans who saw the area of all the objects they used in the building and development of their earliest uh, high culture civilization, their geometrians and mathematicians, or sorry, trigonometrians, citizens, I have also began to challenge much more complex mathematical and scientific problems. They all started, nevertheless, from the most basic, from the base, from the most basic mathematical formulae of the Masonified numerology of the Osirica mystery system, as shown in the following example: Masonic mathematical hieroglyphic calculations, whole numbers, one, ten, uh, a hundred, thousand, ten thousand. Note that the large numbers were written with the highest figures first and then follow the uh, similar sequence. For example, 1,321 is written as, you know, this, this number. Uh, 1,000 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 10 plus 10 plus 1. Uh, a fraction, 2 fifth was written as 1 third plus 1 fifth. Dang. That's good math right here. 1 third plus 1 fifth. That's, that's really good math, because I'm just like, what? Yeah. All right. Although the uh, Nile Valley Africans had many set symbols for certain mixed numbers most were written with a numerator of one uh, i or one under over a denominator so note the commonality of the system with that of pages blah blah, blah. the above calculation as uh, thousands more than the africans developed represented a very early stage of development of their mathematical awareness of the functions of numbers and their equivalent meaning and application to material uh, usage and the spiritual thought processes all of this accomplished before the dawn of Western civilization. In order to multiply, they employed the same uh, whole numbers uh, processes used in the... Wait, hold on a second. I gotta go back. One-third plus one-fifth? Why did he do that? That's not right. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why I was... I thought it would have been right. So, I think he... I think he... A lot of times, he's just. he just... We should probably do this because I think he just—it's a typo. Because why would one third plus one fifth equal two fifth? You know, because one fifth plus one fifth equals two fifth. So one third plus one fifth cannot equal two fifth. That doesn't make any sense. So let's just do this. So this would be five over fifteen. And this would be three over fifteen. Uh, so yeah, this would be eight over fifteen, right? And that's not a—that wouldn't be like that wouldn't be. I don't know why he said that. You know, that, that's the thing that you... A lot of people do not proofread. I mean, I'm not going to say that I proofread all the time. I mean, I, I mean, I do proofread. But I'm saying that, like, that was the thing with a lot of the ancestral books is that they sometimes just write things, you know? And, and that's like, that could, that could cause us to, like, stop and pause. Like, I think he wrote the wrong numbers here because this doesn't even add up to anything. You know, unless I'm doing it wrong, which I'm not. But if I were, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't see it. I don't see. It. I don't know what he was trying to say, because uh, because th there were actual examples of good math, you know. Uh, he kind of just misrepresented it for some reason, uh, like you know, I don't know. What, I don't know what he could. Like, I I wish I could give you what he was trying to say, but you know I can't. Uh, the above calculations, uh, and by the way, I actually met Doctor Ben. Well, like kind of, you know, I got all giddy. Uh, you know, oh my gosh, you met Ben. But he was like an old frail man with a nurse. By his side, and he like eventually passes away, uh, pretty 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 quickly afterward. But uh, and you know that that's kind of how we do our people too. Like he's like a, he was a living legend, and we kind of just made him die alone in a nursing home, you know. Uh, and that's like the tragedy of of the situation where we just do not support our own, and it's 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 actually it's really it's a it's a crying shame. But you know it is what it is. You know like 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 for instance you know people talk about Mumia. Mumia has been in prison for like forty something years, you know, and like for the most part, you know, most people do not discuss it at all, you know, 
but like he's in prison every day, like suffering in prison every day. So, you know, I mean, that's life. That's life. Uh, the above calculations, as thousands more than the Africans developed, represent a very early stage of development of the mathematical awareness of the function of numbers and their equivalent meaning and application to material usage and the spiritual thought processes. All of this they accomplished before the dawn of Western civilization. In order to multiply, they employed the same uh, whole number process used in the addition we used above, except that they had a duplication series. They did this by doubling the multiplicand as many times as were necessary. For example, to multiply the whole number 15 times 13, they did the following. You know, 1 is 15, 2 is 30, 4 is 16, and 8 is 120. And then, of course, they would add up 8 plus 4 plus 1, and that would make them add up 15 plus 16 plus 120. Yeah. So by adding the left column and then corresponding numbers of the right column, they arrived at the answer 1 plus 4 plus 8. 15 plus 60 plus 120 and both added together they got 195 so that's pretty cool I actually like that example uh, yeah exactly 8 over 15 like what is that that's what I'm saying right uh, like like what is that about uh, where are we going alright so the main reason for much of the complexities in the above method of calculation was the fact that Nile Valley and Great Lakes Africans had not yet developed a figure beyond the number 8 uh, at this early period of their history. One must remember that we are dealing with a period that extended far into the past before the first so-called Semites from Asia, the Hyksos, arrived in al Kebulan, Tamari to be exact, which was at the end of the 24th dynasty. Oh, sorry, 14th dynasty. Uh, 1675 BCE. The period we are dealing with was hundreds of years before the first literate Greeks of historical records recorded his first word in his first book, Homer and his Iliad. You know, and this is another thing I want you to realize that 14th dynasty, what does that mean? That means that like a dynasty is just a series of like one family ruling over. You know, so that that's something that you like, people are like, oh, like monarchy. But that was what a dynasty was. So you had like 25 dynasties plus, you know, long living family lines that ruled for like 5,000 years in ancient Kemet. You know? Like, like, like one family after another. You know? Uh, and that would be a, a dynasty. You know? As opposed to like, like what we have now. But alright. Is it not strange that we are taught any of the above facts in courses related to we are not taught is it not strange that we are not taught any of the above facts in courses related to the history of mathematics and institutions specializing in white studies such as public and private schools secular and religious throughout the united states of america europe great britain and all the colonies controlled by europeans and european american powers that be why this is so uh, because these facts cannot be told and those who are in control of racial purity and the protection of the chosen people still retain the myth about moses pythagoras aristotle plato plato uh, Masonic calculations before the birth of King Solomon. Uh, what were the Black Brothers of the Craft? Who was lying? Someone lying? Who? And Euclid, only to mention a few so called great thinkers of the Western world, being the progenitors of the Osirica mysteries, all of them learnt when they were students in Tamari and Ta Nehesis under thick lips, broad nose, woolly haired, and burnt skin, Ethiopians, the ancient name for what is today called Negroes and Bantu. So here's my, like, like this, I, got, I gotta keep saying it though. Like, this is my issue with a lot of these. All, like, you see, this is still the freaking... This is still the prologue. This is still the introduction. This is the introduction. It's going on forever. It has nothing to do with the subject at hand. Black Marxism versus black nationalism. This is more coding, you know, our, our you know, self... You know, our, our like, like, countering the propaganda against us of being inferior and all that stuff. But it's like... Why, like, like, why are we so obsessed with addressing this? And it just, it just coddles your ego, you know. It makes you like, oh yeah, you know, we we were the first one to do math. But it's like, 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 come on, get to the subject already, you know? Uh, get to this. You see what I'm saying? This is about Marx. Like, what? Like, uh, That's what I'm saying. Like, what? What is going on? This is the this is the lack of focus. And this is the thing too. It's like people will be like, hey man. I love the ancestors. You gotta go with the ancestors. You can't talk bad about the ancestors. The ancestors are birds, blah blah blah. And it's like you're not reading like like there is a way like you're not reading quality literature anymore. You know? And I'm not saying this is not quality per se. 
But it's like, like this is a lot. This is just too much for a prologue. You know, this is too much for a pro like like too much. Like like oh my gosh! All right, I'm gonna keep going though. Well, even I'm just like, what the? What is he talking about? All right. For an adequate extension of information beyond this point, respect to the direct calculation of higher mathematics developed from this level by the indigenous Africans of the Nile Valley and Great Lakes high culture, the following work should be consulted. Uh, Stolen Legacy, that's one of the good books. A Tribute to the Negro. Uh, there's always the stage of romanticizing. Yeah, exactly, like too much. Uh, uh, A Tribute to the Negro, George Jackson's Introduction to Africa, so Dr. Ben, uh, Africa, Mother, blah, blah, blah. Uh, The African Before the Foreigners, Ruins of Empire, and I don't really like citing white people either, but Volney's Ruin of Empire, uh, Budge's Book of the Dead, Paris of Annie. All these works will also provide the general reader, researcher, and student with added references to much more extensive and detail dealing with neurology and Masonified mathematics and so forth. Uh, Masonic Chronological Calculations of the Grand Lodge of Luxor, Thebes, The Mysteries. But again, this is Waset. This is the center of dynastic education. So file, working from a formula based on the talismanic numerology, we have the following. The numerical value of white gaze and black gaze keep us distracted from the mission. Exactly. You know? You know? Uh, like, I'm just like, this book could have been a lot shorter. Uh, we have the following. The numerical value of cubic di dax styles A of the talismanic number and the talismanic number D and the square root of the sum of the squares of the length and the height of the arc is equal to the mathematical calculation uh, 2.940 plus equals D. So this is actually a pretty impressive calculation uh but again like i don't know what that has to do with anything by substituting numbers for days we arrive at the length of one sidereal celsius year which is equal to uh 365 days six hours and nine that's actually pretty impressive so he says the numerical value of the talismanic like this is a this is another thing that i actually want to say though like and when you look at the older works of people like they were calculated some really big stuff you know, they were calculating some really big stuff. Uh, even with white boys, they were actually calculating some pretty big stuff. Like, like if you pick up Newton's book, like, and you see the problems that he's solving, it's like, yo. <laughs> like, we don't, we don't do that in physics anymore. You know, like, these are like some geology, like, these are some geometry problems, you know? Uh, yes, uh, the gods with them. So, like, so calculating the, the days and years with this, like, I don't even, like, I don't even know how to do that, to be honest. I don't even know how to do that, but uh, they did it. All right. So, yes, the gods were with them. Gods which the new black Marxist intellectual will never tolerate. We equally in the mind of the creators of the mathematical systems that became and still remain foundation for all the mathematical calculations involving the technology of the entire world, including communist China, Russia, along with capitalist America, Great Britain. That's a few of the gods and goddesses uh, who made created people intelligence before Yahweh, Jesus the Christ, Allah, uh, whatever. All right. Uh, creators of creation, gods, goddesses, and religions before Judaism, Islam, blah, 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 blah. So, okay, so Shu, so you have Set, which is the slayer of God, Osiris. Uh, God, who is Osiris, wearing the crown of the south. Uh, Shu, the air god, holding Newt. So you see Newt is being held up. Uh, the sky god with the embrace of Geb. So Geb is, I guess, the bomb. The earth god lying on the horizontal. The stars of Newt indicate her celestial nature. See the stars on her, on Newt. All right. Uh, the Y-shaped symbols indicate the four supports of heaven and evolution. So the Y, sh the y shape is the four supports. Uh, why were the gods, goddesses... Yeah. That's what I'm saying. This, this prologue is terrible. Uh, why were the gods, goddesses, African children, and why were they dwell and never mention... And never men not... Oh, okay, sorry. It's, it's across. Why were the gods and goddesses never taught to our black African children? And why the holy and sacred land in Africa where they dwell in never mentioned in roots, etc.? So, like, I just want to be clear, though. Look, white people are not going to teach you about your people in their schools. Why are they teaching you? They, they, they have no reason to teach you, period. They're only teaching you because you wanted to integrate into their schools, right? But they have no reason to, to go out of their way to research your history and write books on you and then give you those books to to, to, to to praise you and make you feel good about yourself. White people have no 
reason to do that. There's no financial benefit to it. There's no advantage to it. There's nothing that they gain from being a good people to you. So why would they do that? If they're, if they're, if, like, like, no, like, why were you not? Because why would they? What, what, what do they gain from that? You know, like, what do I gain, you know, from gassing up somebody? You know, like, like, if you're gassing up a, a woman, that's fine, right? Obviously. But if you're just gassing up, like, a perfect stranger, like, what's, what, what do you get? Or are you, are you gassing up your competitor? Why would you gas up your competitor? That's my question. You are their competitor. That's what Gary was saying. I don't know why this, oh, this problem is freaking long. All right. Are these not older than uh, Judaism, Jehovah, uh, Christianity, Jesus, and Christ, and Islam, Allah? Certainly they are older than communism's Marx and Maoism's Mao. Uh, thus, uh, they, sacred holy scriptures, were also written by sacred holy scribes in their book of coming forth uh, by day and by night thousands of years before. There was the first word written by sacred holy scribes of Judaism, Christianity, and or Islam. So, Chum, uh, God of Creation, Fashion, the first Potter Wheel, Potter Wheel, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and they will still teach you what they want you to know for their benefit. Exactly. I mean, like, like exactly. They're going to teach you according to what they want to teach. Like, what they want to teach themselves. They want to teach themselves superiority. Okay? Then you come and you sit down in the class. They're not going to change the lesson for you. They're going to teach themselves superiority and you're going to pick up on, hey, you know what? I'm a white man, and I don't think they're superior. Oh, wait, I'm not a white man. Well, I, now, now I got double consciousness. You know? But that's on you. You you shouldn't be sitting... Like, if I, if I go to China, if I sit down in a class in China, they're not going to change the whole curriculum just for me. You understand? They're not going to be like, oh, well, okay, let's change the whole curriculum because there's a black guy sitting here. Right? No, they're going to teach Chinese history, Chinese superiority, Chinese are good, and, and yeah, they're going to shit on other people. Sorry, I don't mean to curse, but they're going to they're gonna crap on other people. And, and, and that's it. And, and, you, and for you to think, oh, yeah, well, now that I'm here, you should change the curriculum, make the curriculum, tell, tell, you, tell them how good I am. You know, like, the Chinese are not going to make a whole school for me to sit down and learn some good history from them. Why? What does that do for them? They're going to just teach what they're teaching and get the results that they want. They are teaching for the results they want, like Empower is saying. You know, benefits them. They, there are results that they get from their pedagogy, their school, and that's it. That's final. And not gonna they gotta make something unique for you. Why would they do that? And why would they teach teach? Oh yeah, you know, you know the black man made everything, and he's a good person, and he's great. Why would they teach that? Why why would the Chinese people? The Chinese people don't even teach that. The the the, the Indian man, he's not gonna teach that. You know, I I, I had this uh, app on on a, on, a, on a tablet of mine. You know, it's about English learning and all that stuff. And and they're like, who's the father of our country? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like Mahatma Gandhi or some shit, you know, or or whoever the prime minister was. Or, or how many seasons were there? They're like, oh, there's fall, winter, so a rainy season. You know, like, I didn't even know there was a rainy season. But they're talking about India. You know? They're talking about India. Or even like, you know, there's a Chinese-English thing. And they're like, oh, do you want some kimchi? You know, kimchi is a good food. I'm like, I never heard of kimchi. You, you know what I'm saying? But, 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 but you're teaching your own culture. You're the only people. We are the only people who teach, who expect other, no, who don't teach our own culture. Who not only don't teach our own culture, but expect other people to teach us our culture. And then we complain and say, why aren't they teaching? Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, what is this? All right. All the prior pages dealing with the African African blacks, mathematics, gods, and goddesses only prove that much more than Marcus Malagari said about this deity. There must be a black unity among us, even with our differences. The divine apportionment of earth. <sighs> look at this. Still freaking, look, 30, 33. <laughs> In the freaking like thirty three, how are you on page thirty three, in a in a, in a, in a hundred eighty something page book? I don't know how to freaking like this is too much. Uh, divine apportionment of earth. Uh, God Almighty created all men equal, whether they be white, yellow, or black. And for any race to admit that it cannot do what others have done, it is uh to it is hurl an insult of the Almighty who created all races equal to the beginning. In the beginning, so this is Marcus Garvey, obviously. Uh, the white man has no right of way on this green earth, neither the yellow man. All of this were created lords of the creation, and whether we be white, yellow, brown, or black, nature intended a place for each and every one of us. 
If a Europe is for the white man, if Asia is for brown and yellow men, then surely Africa is for the black man. The great white man has fought for the preservation of Europe. The great yellow and brown races are fighting for the preservation of Asia. And 400 million Negroes shall shed, if need be, the last drop of their blood for the redemption of Africa and the emancipation of the race everywhere. Uh, and of course he says one God, one aim, one destiny. Uh, leadership means everything. Pain, blood, death. How dare anyone tell us that Africa cannot be redeemed when we have 400 million men and women with warm blood coursing through their veins. The power that holds Africa is not divine. The power that holds Africa is human and is recognized that whatever, whatsoever man has done, men can do. All of us may not live to see the higher accomplishments of an African empire so strong and powerful as to compel and respect the, the respect of mankind, but we in our lifetime can work and act to make the dream a possibility within another generation. Wake up Ethiopia, wake up Africa. Let US work to get let uh, sorry, let us work together towards the one glorious end of a free, redeemed and mighty nation. Let Africa be a bright star among the constellations of nations. So you see I said US because it was capitalized. Uh, he capitalized randomly. I tried to do that same thing. I tried to do the same thing to be honest. But uh, but yeah. Uh, not no one knows when when the hour of Africa's redemption cometh. It is in the wind, it is coming. One day, like a storm, it will be here. When the day comes, all Africa will stand together. Let Africa be our guiding star, our star of destiny. So I want to say this, and this is from Amy Jones Garvey, is the first of opinion of Michael Garvey. So this is why Michael Garvey. You know, like I said, you know, people will swear by how, you know, swear by how good this book is. And you can already see that, like, nothing related to the subject. And this is why, like, like I, I, I put into writing. I go to writing. You know, this brother. What is this brother gonna say? This guy's always talking about his book. But yeah, I do writing because it's like I know how to write. I know how to focus. I know how to stay focused. One of my books, Zubiri. Like people don't want to probably get it because it's so small. But it's straight to the point. You know, I, dilly dally, take the long way. Here's an introduction. This has nothing to do with Marxism. And it, and it, this is like a, it's supposed to be a serious book. Where you, where you give somebody, you say, look, here, here, we can settle this debate, right? And nothing. What's in her name? Mention Marcus Garvey to the other, others below, alive or dead, and you will see. So Robert Abbott, the founder of the Chicago Defender, A. Philip Randolph, co-editor of The Messengers with Chandler Owens, uh, Mr. Imamu, chairman of Leroy uh, Jones and Ray Baraka, uh, U.S. Senator Edward Brooks, uh, former NOCB, Mass, Ralph Dr. Ralph Bunch, uh, Thurgood Marshall, Harold Cruz, he's an old left, Dr. Clinic Clark. Oh, Dr. Clinic Clark, really? Uh, so, out of the house of Marcus Garvey came Marcus Josiah Garvey, uh, who said, Rise up, you mighty race, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. This is the prophet, Marcus Josiah Garvey, loved dearly, Booker T. Washington, up from slavery. Sit with his legs crossed. All right. Uh, as I conclude this prelude, as I conclude this prelude, Almost, <laughs> yo! All right. Almost 18 months following the completion of the original manuscript for these three volumes works in 1979, I had no up-to-date official document showing the United States of America official policy statement of racial identification and classification. But just a few months before the publication deadline, the United States of America released a memorandum labeled "Supplement to the 1977 Inventory of Comprehensive Community Mental Health Centers," which I have shown on page. Uh, Whatever page that is. I, I don't care for this Roman numeral shit. Alright, I could not ignore the content of the official document, thus I had to alter my already completed prelude to include it in its entirety. Why are you including the United States memorandum in its entirety in the prelude? Not even. It's not even, like, like brothers, like, finally. It's not even. Alright. <laughs> Why are you... Right. Like, you can't... You're not supposed to talk to books. You're not supposed to talk to books, but, like... Like, this is, like, I would not, like, if I was trying to read this, I would not, I would not read it. Like, if I wasn't on camera, I'd be like, no. You know, like, this is the thing with us as authors. We discourage our people from reading. We discourage our people from reading with this terrible style of writing and this lack of focus. Why would you include the memorandum? <sighs> Let me not waste time, okay. Certainly the late sage prophet Osajifo and president general of the United, you know, Universal African Farmers Formerly Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, Marcus Sian Garvey, warned us that each white man, woman, or child is a potential member of the Ku Klux Klan, given the right conditions or situation. The following exhibits more than more than prove Garvey's warning to be correct, for this is the exact official document on race 
All synagogues, churches, mosques, labor unions, educational institutions most use the official policy on race of the United States of America while they're dealing with any government office. It would, and you see how focused it is on America, but whatever. It would appear from this official document on race that its creators, Richard W. Reddick, PhD, have accomplished in one memorandum what Eric Van Daniken could not achieve in his entire book, Chariot of the Gods. The latter's super white races from outer space have been replaced by rhetoric from Washington District of Columbia, the United States of America, as white original people of Europe, North Africa, or the Middle East, not of Hispanic origin. For although there is not a single piece of evidence of any major European white so-called Caucasian occupation of one square inch of North Africa before the conquest of Egypt by the Macedonian Greeks in circa 332 BCE with Alexander II, the so-called Great, and the Philip of Macedonia followed by conquest of Carth Hadas Carthage in 212 BCE by the Romans during the so-called Third Punic War, this official document continues the racist myth of a pure native lily white Caucasian Semitic race of people indigenous to the Caucasus Mountain between Asia and Europe, right? You heard it. <laughs> Europe, so called Eurasia, and simultaneously North Africa before there was a United States of white racist official document of blah blah blah. And he, I, thought, I thought that was it. I thought, I thought that was it. I was like, oh, yay. He's just going to say, nope, he's going to include a freaking memorandum. Yes, <laughs> it's like yo. All right, this memorandum, yo. All right, center direct, like yo. All right, acting chief, uh, supplement to the 1977 inventory of comprehensive community mental health centers. This is to inform you that a supplement to the 1977 inventory of comprehensive C M H C S has been prepared and is awaiting O M B S approval. The supplement is a repetition of the 1974 inventory supplement, which requested the centers to report C H C M H C staff by discipline, sex, and race. Ethnicity, <laughs> he says, just give it around. Ethnicity and uh, two client additions by age, sex, race, and ethnicity in accordance with the following OMB classification for race ethnicity. White, a person having origin in any of the original peoples of Europe, North Africa, and or the Middle East, not of Hispanic origin. Black, a person having origin in any of the black racial groups of Africa, not of Hispanic origin. Hispanic, a person of Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Central, or South American, or other Spanish culture or origin, regardless of race. Asian or Pacific Islander, a person having orig origins in any of the original peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, or the Pacific Island. This area includes, for example, China, India, Japan, Korea, the Philippine Islands, I and Samoa, an American Indian or a lasting native, a person having origins in any of the original peoples of North America who, who maintain cultural identification through the tribal affiliation or community recognition. Analysis of the data reported in 1974 led to the preparation of a set of NMH guidelines and initiated a technical assistance program through the regional offices relating to the provision of mental health services to minorities. The division of biometry, oh, biometry, right? Uh, biometry and <laughs> epidemiology, oh, man, I'm saying too much. I'm saying too much, right? Epidemiology has been asked by the Division of Mental Health Service Program, the Division of Manpower and Training, and the Center for My, uh, Minority Studies to repeat this survey in order to evaluate the efforts and assess the current picture with regard to CMHC minority staff and clients. The memo is being sent to you in the expectation of OMB uh, approval so that with little additional effort, the data for this supplement can be prepared at the same time, the staffing and additional data are being prepared for the 1977 inventory. If you have any questions, all right, yeah, let me skip that one. That was, uh, whatever. Uh, a single African black there, yet this official document failed to recognize that Nubia, Zeti, Tanahesi, Sudan equally was a part of North Africa as much as Mexico was a part of North America. I guess that the so-called Negro Nubians have equally become, through said official document, considering they too were our North Africans, white original people of European, North Africa, or Middle East, uh, uh, so, like, this is the trouble. Like I said, like, he's really, really unfocused. And that's why a lot of people prefer Dr. Clark to Dr. Ben. Because, like, even if you listen to, like, Dr. Clark's lectures, you're going to see a lot a stronger, like, a stronger, more Garveyite, pro-black kind of uh, message. But it's going to be riddled in a bunch of tangents that got nothing to do with nothing. You know? Hey, these white people in 1974, they said that uh, Nubians were black, were white. Okay. What did the Marxist, black Marxist intellectuals and black nationalists, even the white liberal Africanists, do about removing the white racists who prepared and distributed the official 
white racist document. Am I to believe that the United States of America's permanent representative of the United Nations organization, His Excellency Ambassador Andrew Andrew Young, is not aware of the official policy on race description of the United States of America, which he represents internationally? But if he does know, why has he not publicly denounced the white racists involved in his creation and publication half as much as he condemned the Honorable President Idi Amin Dada of the Republic of Uganda, East Africa, who had not done anything whatsoever to him? Equally, why have we not heard from the Executive Director of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, Benjamin Hooks, National Urban League, Vernon Jordan, Black Americans to Save Israelite Committee, Basic, Bayard Rustin, etc., uh, of the so-called responsible Negro colored, so sometimes even called black leadership, uh, condemning these white so-called liberals racist. Are they too sick with menticide to understand the grave consequences of their Hitlerite act? Like, he's going way over the top. Although, I do want to say, this is one thing I also avoid in my books, which is trying to name contemporary people, you know, because I want my books to be timeless. Like, right now, Bayard Rustin, Benjamin Hooks, those mean nothing, you know? Are they too sick with men decide to understand the grave consequences of the Hitlerite Act? How did the content of the official white racist document being no different in scope and depth to the United Nations of Organization's General Assembly condemnation of white racist Zionism for its white racist policy escape the attention of all the responsible Negro colors and so-called white Christian, Jewish, Muslim, atheist, humanist, feudalist, culturalist, capitalist, liberals who have fought every day, everything they and others of their ilk labeled Negro black anti-Semitism and or reverse racism uh, psychological Bobby, psychologist Bobby Wright, PhD of the Garfield Park Comprehensive Community Mental Health Center, Chicago, Illinois, cites this type of abnormal behavior as menticide, the final stage uh, result of a brainwashed African black mind that created a self-hating Negro colored individual. The late honored sage Marcus Messiah Garvey called it insanity total madness, whereas the late martyred brother Malcolm X defined it by virtue of a dialogue in which a black slave asked his dying slave, white slave master, are we sick, boss? Truly meant aside, Dr. Wright. So there could have been no better manner in which I could have introduced you, my readers, to a safari in volume book one of the saga of the black Marxists versus the black nationalists, the debate resurrected. For in this volume of the root cause of the Garfield's type of African nationalism and pan-Africanism is justified in the theory of the working class of all races and common unity against the capitalist class. So, so this is what socialism is. The working class of all races in common unity against the capitalist class is defeated. At least within the United States of America, there could be no doubt Marcus Messiah Gary was absolutely right when he said, each white man, woman, or child is a potential member of the Ku Klux Klan given the right conditions in our situation. We African black men, we African black people of the first, never second, or third world whose ancestors created the very first high culture civilization along the banks of the Great Lakes and valleys of the Nile, Blue, and White Rivers are no less intelligent than the European white people they civilize. Thus, we shall equally create our own economic system based upon our own needs and wants and desires. This is our African black ancestors did thousands of years before there was a first man named Adam and a first woman named Eve. We find the Hebrew five books of Moses old thing. Uh, I want to say this too. The trouble with us as a people, too, is that we keep saying, we will create a system. We're going to create our own system. We should develop our own system. No! You you should have done that a long time ago. And and that's why I wrote my book. I said, look, if you're really looking for your own system, just read my book. Instead of just continually, oh, we should create our own system. We should... Like, this guy, like, like, like Dr. Ben wrote this book 50 years ago. And and to hear people today still saying, we need to create our own system. It's, it's despicable. It's despicable. All right. Yes, gentlemen, we can no longer be denied. You know, this is Marcus Garvey talking to the European powers. And, you know, you see Portugal and France and all that. You know that black nationalism is rooted in the civil rights movement in the United States of America. African nationalism, like Pan-Africanism, is rooted in African independence freedom. African nationalism is the same as Garveyism to the African nationalism. So this is where I was talking about, that African nationalism is not... Like, you see, African nationalism and black nationalism are two different things. Black nationalism being the civil rights movement thing, and African nationalism being, you know, African independence uh, and all that stuff. So credit, I am convinced that giving credit is about the most difficult task in completing a book, for it is in this juncture that the very long-standing friendships are sometimes damaged beyond repair, all because the author must must single out individuals he or she feels were most responsible for helping him or her way, way to complete the work, while no mention of others personally related certainly prevails. In this experience, my, own, my most outstanding family or loyal friends, etc., were Professor George E. Simmons, of the Malcolm King. So, like, you, you got friends. They should have told you, hey, dude, your prelude's kind of long. That's what they should have done. Uh, Georgie Simmons of Malcolm King. Like, you have collaborators. They should... All right, let me stop. We're patiently <laughs> back-checking the document. The dude checked the document and just said, yeah, let's keep this. All right. Woo! Okay. <laughs> 
Virginia Mixon, who untiringly proofread the final manuscript for errors. And she didn't catch that freaking edition thing. Okay. Uh, Mary Lewis. All right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to be calm. I'm going to be calm. It's just, just a lot. It's just a lot. It's just a lot. I'm hungry. I'm hungry now. And I, I'm reading a prelude that's like 40 freaking pages. But I'll, I'll stop. I'm just joking. I'm not. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm cool. Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just keeping it entertaining, right? Uh, I don't have anger management problems. <laughs> I'm joking. All right. Mary Lewis uh, for uh, making much of the correction of the typewritten manuscript and Gregory Hardy, my former student and another study in history and Egyptology, for performing many forms of general office work related to the completion of the manuscript, etc. All these individuals have worked without one cent of remuneration. Dang. He didn't pay them? That's crazy. All right. I mean, maybe that's why they didn't check all the... <laughs> maybe that's why they didn't check the errors. Anyway, the out-of-sight African black people who gave out their monies, each according to his or her ability, are the following. Dr. Arthur Lewis and his wife, Mary Lewis, of New York City, uh, New York and Wilmington, North Carolina. Sister Ala, Olive Moore of South Ozone. Brother, brother G2 Wayusi of the East Brooklyn, New York. I actually don't... Like, this guy, I think... Like, I mean, if we had an intelligence agency, they would talk about this dude. He's dead now. He passed away. But, like, essentially, when, when the Freedom Party was being betrayed, he was one of them. Like, everybody in New York pretty much betrayed it, but, yeah. And the Reverend Professor Curtis Alexander of Norfolk in New York City. Uh, along with the above are always the cooperative brother Gil Nobles, who had the show Like It Is, and his assistant, Alambe Brath, I guess both of them had Like It Is, on channel WABC, all of whom constantly struggle to focus on the history and heritage of African black people the world over, and as such help us to reach... Uh, greater heights than ever our glorious ancestors. So m one thing you want to know is that Like It Is was replaced by a show called Here and Now. So Like It Is used to have like was like a pro-black television and essentially the FCC requires that you have some sort of African cultural television you know in like at least an hour slot a week. Once a week you're required to by the FCC and that's where Like It Is comes in. You know they, they, they legally sued for it and so Like It Is was replaced by Here and Now and, you know, there was this guy, uh, I mean, you know, when I was in the organization, uh, United, the UAM, uh, the, the chairman, Alton Maddox, was like, uh, you know, he's going to sue that because, you know, they're, they're going to sue the FCC for their, like, their censorship of, like, pretty much, like, this was, like, black political discourse and black ideological. And here and now was just a bunch of cultural stuff, you know, but it's just, like, just fading out on public policy for black people. So it's, uh, it's like, you know, whatever they give, they can take away because it's their country. And that's what sovereignty means. That's what autonomy means. So so that's like something that I just want you to, you know, realize. Heritage of African people the world over and as such help us greater heights than our glorious ancestors. And see, I want to say this too. That's a nice way of doing a tangent. You see, I did a tangent. It teaches you a little bit, a short, I don't go through long like it is. And, you know, this was the show. This, uh, you know, this program and this program. I didn't even watch the show. But you see, that, that's how you have to do it. Not this long tangent. Oh, here's the memorandum in full. Uh, lastly to you, the irresponsible and responsible of the Harlems of the entire world, whose black and black being made me its servant. You, who are the main cause for everything I have written as an author. You, my father's mother's sister's brothers and all, my extended family. You, for everything. Having never once before felt obliged to follow any of the guidelines established by the so-called trade publishers and their publications in the past, and seeing no reason why I should begin now, let this credit further represent a total departure from the standard version. In so doing, let me give... Let me equally give very special credit to the memory of the late honored African nationalist, Pan-Africanist, father and first vice president of the Republic of Kenya, East Africa, His Excellency Jomo Kenyatta, burning spear who died on August 25th, 1978, for he gave me hundreds of millions of African black brothers and sisters support and leadership in my own struggle against Asian, European, British, and European American genocide, slavery, imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism, etc. at a period in history when fighting these enemies of African black people seemed almost totally futile and impossible. I do not know... I do know there are those who... Whatever to defame, oh, try to defame his life's work of independence and freedom for Kenya and Kenyans, and there will be those who will try to burnish his sacred memory, sacred holy memory, all in order to prove to themselves with their only importance in life, the destructive preaching and teaching of gloom and doom, the new missionaries, etc., the total history of any man or woman begins in birth and ends with death. No place in between is as complete, nor should it be judged by its, in its totality and its juncture of its safari, teaching a very old African proverb. Most of all, credits goes to the hundreds of millions of African black people from the homes of the world, like myself, all of us so-called irresponsible blacks, for whom many responsible 
Negroes pretend to speak and represent in our name, never once securing our authority, permission to uh, so act. To them, all of us, Amon Ra, glory to be the blacks forever, Isis. Okay. So, come, buddy. Come back, buddy. You ain't lost nothing in Africa. So, uh, the ragamuffin. <laughs> this is for you. you so, the, the, they're saying, go back to Africa. This is Firestone in the ship. SS Firestone. You know? All right. So, finally. So this is where it's really finally. You know, I, I see a lot of people are just like, yeah. Like, I... I need to pick smaller books. That's what I thought this was a small book. And when I first looked at it, I was like, oh, it's probably just a bunch of glossary. Anyway. A concept taught by Pharaoh Akhenaten. Okay, so yeah. So look, you see, this is what's really important. Where is this note, though? Oh, man, know thyself. Man, never. No, man, African woman, child, never, Negro, colored. Know yourself. Okay, man, know yourself. This is a concept taught by Pharaoh Akhenaten, Amen the IV. Uh... At least 41 years before the birth of Moses and thousands of years before Jesus, he taught monotheism, a form of black theology, and became the foundation for the one God above all others, theosophy of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Garvey and Du Bois' enemy, not unlike those of Akhenaten's, would not let either of them rest, sleep in peace, but they fight back from their graves. Just imagine the descendants of the people who created the masterpiece below on this page. I thought he was done. I thought he was done. All right. Oh, he is done. He's just still on a tangent. All right, whatever. I saw this inside of the other book. All right. Let's imagine the descendants of the people who created this masterpiece below on this page are being told by others related to them that they cannot equally create uh, an economic system like any other ethnic and racial group of people in Asia and Europe. Uh, okay, long books. Uh, the law of opposites. So I, I love this. Is actually a really cool diagram. You know, you got hot, cold, wet, dry, fire, earth, water, air. You know, the four elements and the four qualities and the eight poles. Uh, if the indigenous African black people are incapable of creating their own economic system today, unlike their ancestors that created communalism, then why did we ever begin to fight European and European Americans, as well as Asian imperialism, slavery, and continental wide physical and cultural genocide? Could the answer be that we are crippled by our Western brainwashing from one type of economic slave master teaching capitalism in the past and another type of economic slave master teaching socialism at present? Or maybe it is due to the religious type of arrogance in the first line of the following page, this being equally as presumptuous as Wilson J. Jones' condemnation of Garvey providing proving nothing. Actually, I want to see how long this was freaking... Dang! It was just the freaking prologue, and that was two hours. That's a long time. But like I said, you know, I, I'm just going to read this, you know, just to read it. But, uh, you know, I completely understand if people you know want to just catch the rewind or something. I don't know. But, yeah. Shh. Two hours to freaking read just a prologue. Woo! All right. Being equally as presumptuous as Wilson J. Jones' condemnation of Garvey proving nothing. My God is the only and one only true God. I was, uh, uh one, an only true God. I was wondering where I read something very similar. Could it have been that I heard it from certain black capitalist intellectuals as capitalism free enterprise is the only way to economic peace? Or instead from a group of new left Marxist social, socialists proselytizing their own myth, socialism is the only scientific way to economic salvation. I had heard the above expressed many times in the form of the following. Anything against imperialism, capitalism is my ally forever. Um, well, two different things. On the opposite side of the coin, it... No, anything against imperialism capitalism is my ally forever. On the other side of the coin, it sounds the same, but with a different God in sacred text. Communism, Marxism, Socialism kills a man's basic initiative. But only one of the above three positions, and sometimes a lot more, am I being asked at this juncture, the so-called black experience to accept as the only way of economic and political freedom. The Marxist missionaries peddling this type of religious holy scripture have assigned to themselves a the nomenclature, black intellectuals. Some of them are even changing this political affiliation and former economic philosophy as often as every seventh year, somehow very similar to the so-called seventh year follow we constantly read about in the Judeo-Christian Islamic holy scriptures that are otherwise known as the Pentateuch or Old Testament, New Testament, and Quran, etc., in essence, the uh, entire approach of the so-called new black left intellectuals is no less typical to the ethics of religion by the three so-called Western religions. I have noted above, thus separated, 
separately called Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The worst aspect is that capitalism is made to appear that it too was God-inspired, and the inspiration is recorded in the Old Testament and New Testament. On the other hand, I'm equally to understand that Karl Marx's Das Kapital superseded all three of the holy scriptures of the Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and their God has Jehovah, Jesus, and Allah, and its relativity to human salvation because it deals with man's economic material needs scientifically instead of the outdated method of spiritual dependency on a God. Uh, we African black people are now experiencing a return to the age-old argument about the priority of the spiritual self versus the material self as if one is free and totally independent of the other. It's the same sort of rationale in the new black left and new black right so-called intellectuals seek to impose upon those of us non-intellectuals who prefer to be categorized either as socialists or capitalists of any type of vintage whatsoever. But we are being told that the issue of Marxism, socialism versus imperialist capitalism demands that blacks must choose one side or the other. I do want to say this. I want to stop for a second because you see how long this was. I do want to say that I would not read this book. I think a lot of people do not, like we, we complain that our people do not read the books of our ancestors. I would not read this book because it's so poorly written. It's so poorly organized and and like the concepts are so out there and antedated by now like this like it's it's actually i would not read this and that that's the thing that happens with our our people we like this is why i approach literature different because at the end of the day no 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 like no one's gonna be like this like we 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 don't realize that a lot of our ancestors did not write well they just did not write well martin delaney did write well okay he, he wrote, Martin Delaney wrote well, Garvey wrote excellently, okay? So that, that's why you give people Garvey. You give people Garvey, you give people Delaney, you give people J.A. Rogers. You, these are the people that uh, write really well. You know, you give them me, obviously. But, but, but this right here, Dr. Ben, no, no. Yet the qualification for becoming an African patriot rests with one's own loyalty to some European or Asian. That's Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, Vladimir, I, I don't know what the name V.I. Lenin, Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh and equally Fidel Castro of Cuba, we even hear this another way. You have to be a Marxist in order to qualify as a true Pan-Africanist or African nationalist regardless of involvement. I actually heard this on the freaking Discord. I heard this on the Discord. Like on the private Discord. You have to be a Marxist. This is what Kwame Nkrumah says. This is what Kwame Ture says. They all say this. Etc. But the big question is, do I have to be a Pan-Africanist in order to become a Marxist? The next question then generally... Um, Exactly. The big question is, do I have to be a Pan-Africanist in order to become a Marxist? No! The next question that generally follows immediately equally comes to mind. What about those of us who do not embrace Marxist socialism or imperialist capitalism yet struggle for African freedom and independence? Maybe we are told that we are not entitled to consider ourselves African nationalists or Pan-Africanists of any kind. You see? And this is what I'm saying. Like, 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 you don't have to be a Pan-Africanist to become a Marxist, but you have to be a Marxist to be a Pan-Africanist. That's why, like, Dr. Ben has a good thinking he's a really good thinker he's not a good writer and that's that's something that you know like 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 i appreciate that when i was in when i was in college or high school or something uh when i was in college or high school one of the two i uh like like that's that's the pressure the pressure wrote on my paper he said you know, when i was in high school yeah when i was in high school they were like you do good thinking but you're not a good writer you know and then when i got to college i learned how to write you know but you have to you have to study how to write this right here this Dr. Ben is somebody who just, I just don't think he studied how to write. He stu or if he did, he just didn't care about it. But uh, he studied how to think. And so this right here is a good thought process. This is a good question. This is a good question. But, you know, you know, you don't, you don't see that. So if so, then many of the grandfathers and fathers of African nationalism, and, and the, also those of Pan-Africanism, like Dr. Uh, Edward Wilmot Blyden, Reverend John Chilebe, Simulewe, Casey Hayford, Celeste Williams, Marcus I. Garvey, et al. will have to be removed after reevaluation from the list of African patriots by the so called black new Marxist socialist intellectuals who would rule them out of pan African history and heritage as their white brothers have done in the Soviet Union to Joseph Stalin and Nikita Khrushchev, their yellow brothers, and to Le Paul in the People's Republic of China. This is as if saying, President Julius Nyerere loves Africa more than President Idi Amin because he is a Marxist socialist. Uh, with this type of imposition by the so-called black Marxist intellectuals, whether Pan-Africanists or not, we must observe the seed of this unity being sowed once again among all of us African black people by other blacks doing the white Marxist master's business just like others doing their white capitalist master's bidding. Uh, 
One more time, and here we, Black Intellectuals, go at it again. The following extract picks up the first or another bitter front page story campaign designed to destroy African nationalism, as did the same destroyed Garveyism. Uh, strange, President Amin fights the same imperialist President President Nyerere fights, affected nor by the enemies, the so-called Marxist intellectuals. Uh, Rollers and managers, white, left, right, fighters, black, left, right, uh, round one of the black intellectuals versus black, black new left intellectuals versus black new right intellectuals. So the black intellectuals divide over into ideological direction. Uh, this is here all James, Marie Baraka, and John Oliver Killen. So, Amiri Baraka would say, our struggle is a struggle to destroy capitalism. Black liberation is socialist revolution. The problem with instant Marxists is that there is a, theirs is a misinterpretation of Marx. C.L. James said, in the 30s, Trotskyites and Stalinists never quarreled. This quarreling now, they're quarreling, this quarreling now, I don't understand. Okay. All right, so an intense and growing ideology. You know, only because I said I was going to read this to you guys. Only because I said that, you know? Only because I said it. An intense and growing ideological debate between the advocates of a new communist socialism and advocates of black nationalism have galvanized major segments of the black intellectual and activist community. The debate, which has sparked numerous conferences along with the proliferation of position papers in scholarly journals and magazines, is a chief development in black thought since the civil rights movement culminated in black power in the late 19th century. Its importance is itself a matter of debate. There are those who feel that it is a confusing, uninformed, divisive, and irrelevant. But there are others, including historians and political scientists, who view it as a part of a historical pattern of black development in which periods of activism are followed by periods of introspection and theorizing. Spurred by frustration, thus it is the graduates of the civil rights movement and the student movement whose restlessness whose restlessness and frustration over falling short of their goals of complete liberation have set the stage of this new development of the cyclical process of a, as one historian described it. The conflict is at once national, international, scholarly, and emotional, uh, courteous and acrimonious, confused and lucid, serious and humorous. At the 6th Pan-African Congress in Tanzania last fall, the 200-member American delegation was awestruck when representatives of one African government after another advocated socialist solutions to race problems, which these speakers said, to the American dismay, were based on class and not on blackness or race. There, as here, the basic issue is whether race and culture is the most important factor in the oppression of black people or whether being poor is. The issue is color and culture versus class, a debate that black thinkers have engaged in since emancipation. It has gained a new urgency today, however, among young whites too, but particularly among blacks who are experiencing the worst of an economic downturn that is expected to continue for some time. Many black studies, and this is the interesting thing about black, about black news is that it, it, could be, it, could be, it could be today. This could have been written today. And you would have been like, yeah. Except for you'd be like, why are they talking about Mary Baraka? Or, or he looks kind of young. But this could have been written today. You know, oh, black people are poor. You know, this could have been written today. But anyway, ma many black studies uh, departments at universities invited over the issue. And many organizations, including the National Black Assembly, are torn by it. Because there are divisions within each group, depending on degrees of orthodoxy, strict definitions are difficult. Uh, moreover, there are Marxist Leninists among the blacks who maintain a pan Africanist view, and there are black nationalists who hold socialist views. Yeah, black nationalists who, so, yeah. Marxist Leninists among the blacks who maintain a pan Africanist view, yeah. Uh, generally, however, the new Marxist Leninists reject the Communist Party USA and the Communist movement of the 1930s as fake and revisionist. Los Angeles Davis is not a party to this debate and sees blacks in their role of imitators. Among the scientific socialists, who emphasize economic class struggle and the overthrow of capitalism and imperialism are Amiri Baraka, the activist, poet, uh, playwright, Ron Karenga, mm -hmm. uh, the activist philosopher, now serving a sentence from of of 10 years in the California Penal Institution for aggravated assault. Like, he just whipped a woman. He whipped a woman. You're not know, supposed to whip women, you know, period. But, like, he whipped a woman. Uh, so that's what it is. I see. But, of course, now he's like, this is the guy who created Kwanzaa. Milana Karenga is the guy who created Kwanzaa uh, and you know every December we always debate should we so let me celebrate Kwanzaa they're good principles you know anyway and he whips a woman uh, S.E. Anderson a mathematician on the faculty of Old Westbury College of Long Island Owusu Saduki uh, formerly head of the now defunct Malcolm X Liberation University in North Carolina and Mark Smith former vice chairman of the youth organization of black unity uh, Mr. Walters uh, 
responding in black scholar invade against the many brothers and sisters trapped in an imperfect understanding of the long distance imperative of black nationalism and pan-africanism and the turn toward marxism has represented a way out a way to take off their african clothes change back their names refry their hair pick up white friends again uh in addition to the wait what turn towards marxism made them take off their african clothes okay into the change made by some marxist leninists that the nationalists only want to talk about how many kings we had in africa mr karenga criticizes them for mass contradictions among blacks in pursuit of an elusive ideal unity but he goes on regardless of chitlins fried chickens and soul dancing doing it dancing doing it and rhythm there are basic conflictual differences among blacks and those are class differences charles v hamilton a political why is he why is he doing this all right a political <laughs> a political scientist at uh columbia university and co-author with stokely Carmichael of black power the politics of liberation in america holds the view that even among those who appear to have conflicting positions there tends to be more similarities than differences and that signing labels add little clarity on the current debate dr hamilton argues that both sides are basically socialists and that their positions with respect to the masses of black people are not that far apart both sides are accused for example of focusing neither on immediate needs of the people nor on public policy issues yet on both sides there are people who argue that they are involved in thinking about or moving to affect these issues in one way or another uh division over the workers a major perceptual division is occurring, however, around the attitude toward the worker. Mr. Smith, who has been active in union organizing efforts among textile workers in North Carolina, writes in the January-February issue of Black Scholar, One experience, our experience has been that in struggling alongside black workers on the job, struggling to organize a caucus to fight corrupt units, union leadership, one of the first points open up and look at an ideology that embraces whites in a way that would not be poisoned by the realities of racism. C.L. James, a leading Trinidadian Marxist theoretician and author, now living and teaching in Washington, refuses to discuss the current debate. Part of the answer may be found in his historical work of the Haitian Revolution, The Black Jacobins, which is a really good book, first published in 1938, in which he wrote, the race question is subsidiary to the class question in politics, to think of imperialism in terms of race is disastrous, but to neglect the racial factor as merely incidental is an error only less grave than to make it fundamental. Although his life and works have spanned nearly a century of black ideological development, he confides in a whispery voice that he does not understand the conflict. In George Padmore's book, Pan-Africanism and Communism, is an account of the work we did between 1935 and 1939. I was the editor of both the Trotsky paper and the Padmore's the Stalinists, and we never quarreled. They were for the revolutionary emancipation of Africa, and that was okay with us. We were for overthrowing of capitalism, and that was okay with them. Okay, the overthrow of capitalism, that was okay with them. This quarreling now, I don't understand it. Uh, so, oh yeah, so that's the difference between Trotsky and Stalin. So Trotsky might have been more international focused, and Stalin was more national focused, you know? So that's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, but of course, it's also nonsense. People will say that the Trotskyites were just trying to get into panties. All right. If there are those among the elite who do not understand, many feel that the masses with whom they all profess some affinity have no idea of it all. The elites are carrying them the discussion on as if the correct decision is absolutely fundamental for the struggle to go on. And they are absolutely wrong, said one black historian who also prefers to stay out of the fray. For many of the intellectuals involved in debate, however, there's a concern that basically what is wrong with it is that it is not broad-based enough. As one former activist from the 60s said, we wrote off everybody, the church, the political parties, the bourgeoisie, while it may not be all, well, all we want to be, what is there and is organized. These Jesse Jacksons, for instance, Jesse Jackson doesn't fit into the equation, but he's trying to make a religious movement the basis for a new movement. We criticize Jesse for being a capitalist, but that's not really important. He can mobilize. While not everyone agrees with that position, there are many who ba ba there are many whose battle scars are beginning to show, at least privately. As a result, despite the existence of public rancor, exchanges are going on behind the scene. Meanwhile, the several groups, including the Institute of the Black World, are attempting to pull the diverse theoreticians together for some principled discussion. One historian who is also interested in such an approach uh, warned that if the his discussion are to have any meaning, they got to learn to talk about Marx without talking about their mamas. Okay, so uh, 
With all praises due to our sister Charlene Hunter for the masterpiece above I have extracted from the front page of the New York Times, I must, however, add that Marcus Messiah Garvey, a man of the people, warned us that this day was coming very soon, the day when African people would be found in the presence of their self-styled slave master condemning each other for the recognition of one group of slave masters or another. This very same game was played by the so-called old left against the so-called old right, otherwise the international black Marxists versus the African nationalists using the slogan, black and white workers unite. Now, I do want to say that's the same with the Democrats and Republicans. Like, we're fighting each other over the Democrats and Republicans party. And it's like just one slave master versus another, uh, in a sense. Uh, the above article equally lends itself as an introduction to the same type of black versus black for the benefit of whites. Unfortunately, the blacks involved are also called by the title black intellectuals. But Gary was equally as wise in recognizing the attitude of the so-called colored intellectuals of his period and time. Understanding what, what he was saying then, I'm at a loss to see how... The current verbal revolutionists are any different to those who are addressing he was addressing more than 50 years ago also over the caribbean islands the americas and the continent of alcapulan not only have most of us not heard a single word of his caution many of us even find it necessary to revive the issue of the boys versus garvey as a means to cover the marxist leninist maoist uh new black left uh, versus the african nationalist always all black debacle thus wait, hold on a second. Thus, there seems to be a second go-around beginning for an anti garveyite African campaign, uh, similar to that which developed during the early 1900s by the Stalinists and our Trotskyites, this time by the Maoists and our Brezhnevists, and came out of the militants during the beginning of 1972, as demonstrated by the following extract from the Black Scholar Journal of Black Studies and Research under the heading of title of a reprisal, reappraisal of the movement, uh, pages 38 to 29. And people say that I... I quote other words. Come on. It is not my intention to abuse the memory of Marcus Gary, but rather to attack the uncritical adulation of him that leads to the practice of red baiting and to the divisive rhetoric of blacker than thou. It is one thing I submit to support Pan African unity and the liberation of Africa, as we all must, quite another to attribute the modern Pan African movement to Garvey. It is particularly dangerous to accept unquestioningly the, those statements made by Garvey when he was attempting to discredit his rivals for leadership of the black community. When I have ventured such statements in the past, the response has usually been, but Garvey was the first man to mobilize the black masses, or he built the black man's self respect. My answer is that of course he led the black masses, and so did Prophet Jones, but where to and for what purpose? Did he really build the black man's self respect or did he simply exploit a strong black pride that was already present in the black community those who oppose an elitist history will certainly not attribute the awakening of an entire nation of the strength of one man's will now i, I actually garvey did have a lot of credit but anyway what the garvey moment suggests to me is that the harlem community of 1919 was ready for a powerful and meaningful black nationalist movement it deserves better leadership than they got it could be argued that the disillusionment of the black masses after the failure of the Garvey movement led to the cynicism about Garvey that was later transferred to black nationalism in general, and that the only only in recent years have Afro Americans recovered from the damage done by Garvey to the extent that this was once again considered Pan Africanism a respectable doctrine. The purpose of this paper and of course we come back to the cycle where Pan African is not considered uh, respectable today. The purpose of this paper is to explore some of the myths about Garvey and the encourage some debate as to the real nature of the movement of which he assumed leadership. Uh, the man of the people myth. I suppose that they, what, what we use the phrase a man of the people, we usually mean a leader who is able to appeal to a large body of followers who represent the common folk of a nation or a race. I think we also imply that he is one of the people, one of those people that he understands those people and that his experiences are similar to those of the people he claims to represent. Let us look at Garvey's autobiography and see how well he conforms to these standards. Garvey was born far better off than the average Jamaican in 1887. He was the son of a fairly prosperous stonemason who always acted as if he did not belong among the villagers. The senior... Who is it, what is he quoting? Anyway. The senior Marcus Garvey was a morose and solitary man, but he was not totally antisocial. He was a member of a Wesleyan congregation presided over by a white man. He was among the four children of his white minister and the five children of another white man uh, whose, prop whose property adjoined that of the Garveys. The young Marcus Gar the Marcus Garvey found his first playmate. The early years was unmarred by any knowledge of racial prejudice, says Garvey. The little white girl whom I liked most knew whom I liked most knew no better than I did myself. We were two innocent fools who never dreamed of a race feelings and problem. When, when what about comparing Du Bois with Prophet Sweet Daddy Grace instead of Garvey with Prophet Jones? Would, it, would I not be as ignorant in such a temp, content as is Wilson J. Jones? Yes, much worse. So basically he's saying that, you know, Du Bois had a white pastor too, obviously. 
Uh, so I don't know why you're going like Garvey and his prophet. You know his uh his pastor. Anyway, um. All right. So Garvey's philosophy and opinion, a few of them at least, also scared the hell out of other Du Bois writers, as they did hundreds more before and since. The chronological order in which the following extracts appear may not have been the order in which fear was transmitted to each individual who ran from their own blackness to a type of black and white unite ca calling card of the Congress of Industrial Workers, CIO, before it forgot its other slogan with respect to so-called tolerance for Negroes. Of course, all this was before the racist white labor force of the above joined hands with their fellow white racists in the American Federation of Labor, AF of L, to become the joint mass racist monster it is now AFL and CIO. The master taught us about the races. Uh, so I want to say that, like, uh, just, to try to, just to emphasize, socialism is black and white unity. That's what the problem is. That socialism is black and white unity. That's really the, the summary. You know, I don't know why he has so many pages just to say that, but that's really the summary. So the character of races, blacks and whites are proportionally bad as well as proportionally good living under the same condition and environment of our imperfect civilization. Uh, so I don't actually agree to this. I think whites are just much worse. But anyway, all beauty, virtue, and goodness are the exclusive attributes of no one race. All humanity have their shortcomings. Hence, no statement of mine at any time must be interpreted as a wholesale praise of or attack upon any race, people, or creed. There are good and bad Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and Klansmen. I will not wholesale... I will not wholesalely condemn any one group of the human race for the selfish good of another. The Negro needs as much moral reformation as anyone else. He lies, he steals, and he breaks the commands of God. Like any other sinner, and his crime merit the same punishment as meted out to others. No one can influence me to be against Jews because they are Jews, Catholics because they are Catholics, or Klansmen because they are Klansmen. I condemn evil character whensoever, wheresoever I find it in friend or foe, but I do not carry prejudice to the innocent because of their friendship for or association with the evildoer for whom they are not responsible. So that's a good way to look at life. You know, like like I said, I like like because actually a lot of times even on the Discord you might see people, oh, you know, the Jews and blah blah blah, blah and, the, and, the, and even though the clan, you know, and and Garvey's just saying, look, like I'm gonna judge people based on their individual thing. Like I'm not gonna carry prejudice. Now I don't agree with that. Obviously, you want to carry some prejudice, but I think, particularly with these groups, it's not... Like, maybe the clan, though. I really... You know. But, like, even so, like... Like, at the end of the day, it, it's really about what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to accomplish domination of America, obviously, the clan's gonna be against you. But if you're just trying to get out of America, like, the clan doesn't care. Uh, what we believe... Or, well, uh, you as an individual, they don't care. What, what we believe, the Universal Negro Improvement Association advocates the uniting and blending of all Negroes in one strong, healthy race. It is against miscegenation and race suicide. It believes that the Negro race is as good as any other and therefore should be as proud of itself as others are. It believes in the purity of the Negro race and the purity of the white race. It is against rich blacks marrying poor whites. It is against rich or poor whites taking advantage of Negro women. It believes in the spiritual fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. It believes in a social and political, physical separation of all peoples to the extent that they promote their own ideas and civilization the privilege of trading and doing business with each other it believes in the promotion of a strong and powerful negro nation in africa it believes in the rights of all men universal negro Proof association blah blah you are black so he's saying these are things that people are afraid of right you are black a majority of the black and white boys separated and took different courses in life I grew then to see the difference between the races more than more. My schoolmates as young men did not know or remember me anymore. Then I realized that I had to make a fight for a place in the world, that it was not to so easy to pass on to office and position. Personally, however, I have not I have not much difficulty in finding and holding a place for myself, for I was aggressive. At eighteen I had an excellent position as manager of a large printing establishment, having used my control having having under my control several men old enough to be my grandfathers. But I got mixed up in public life. I started to take an interest in the policies of my country, and then I saw the injustice done to my race because it was black, and I became dissatisfied on that account. I went traveling to South and Central America and parts of the West Indies to find out if it was so elsewhere, and I found the same situation. I set sail for Europe to find out if it was different there, and again I found the stumbling block. You are black. I read of the conditions in America. I read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington, and then my... And then my doom, if I may so call it, of being a race leader dawned upon me in London after I had traveled throughout almost half of Europe. I asked, where is the black man's government? Where is his king and his kingdom? Where is his president, his country and his ambassador, his army, his navy, his men of big affairs? I could not find them. Then I declared, I will help to make them. 
becoming naturally restless for the, the opportunity of doing something for the advancement of my people, I was determined that the black man would not continue to be kicked about by all the other races of the nations of the world, as I saw in the West uh, Indies, South and Central America and Europe, and as I read it of it in Euro America. My young and ambitious mind led me into a fight of great imagination. I saw before me then, even as I do now, a new world of black men, not peons, serfs, dogs, and slaves, but a nation of sturdy men making their impress upon the civilization and causing a new light to dawn upon the human race. I could not remain in London any lot more. My brain was a fire. There was a world of thought to conquer. I had to start ere it become too late and the work to not be done. Immediately I boarded a ship at Southampton for Jamaica, where I arrived on July 15, 1914. The Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities Imperial League was founded and organized five days after my arrival with the program of uniting all the Negro peoples of the world into one great body to establish a country and government absolutely their own. Where did the name of the organization come from? It was while speaking to a West Indian Negro who was passenger on the ship with me from Southampton who was returning home to the West Indies from Batusulan a Basutu land with his Basutu wife that I further learned of the horrors of native life in Africa. He related to me such horrible and pitiable tales that my heart bled with me, within me. Retiring to my cabin all day and the following night, I pondered upon under the subject matter of this conversation, and at midnight, lying flat on my back, the vision of thought came to me that I should name the organization the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, Imperial League. Such a name, I thought, would embrace the purpose of all black humanity. Thus to the world, a name was born, a movement created, and a man became known. This explanation includes another two pages, which would be cut off at this point, to not suffer in any way its intent philosophically or otherwise, not even as Pan-African as planned above. Thus he wrote the policy of the colored intellectual. The present-day Negro or colored intellectual is no less a liar and a cunning thief than his illustrious teacher. His Occidental... Collegiate training, Occidental means Western, collegiate training only fits him to be rogue and vagabond and a seeker after the easiest and best by following the line of least resistance. He is lazy, dull, and uncreative. His purpose is to deceive the less fortunate of his race and by his wiles ride easily into position and wealth at their expense and thereafter agitate for and seek social equality with the creative and industrious whites. To every rule, however, there is the exception. In this case, it must be applied. So he's talking about the uh, the black the, the negro the colored intellectual uh, you know the black leaders of today too you know what I mean uh, the position of brother Garvey is more than supported by the works by brother Jones and also brother Harold Cruz the latter being one of the castoffs from the old left that proved to us a thousand more colored negroes what ne Garvey is saying from his grave this very day about the treachery of the old colored left thus his point the negro communism trade unionism and his friend beware of Greeks bearing gifts if I must advise the Negro workman, working man, and laborer, I should warn him against the present brand of communism or workers' partnership as taught in America, and to be careful of the traps and pitfalls of white trade unionism in affiliation with the American Federation of White Workers or Laborers. It seems strange and a paradox, but the only convenient friend the Negro worker or laborer has in America at the present time is the white capitalist. Uh, the capitalist being selfish, seeing only the largest profit out of labor, is willing and glad to use Negro labor wherever possible on a scale reasonably below the standard white union wage. He will tolerate the Negro in any industry except those of the necessarily guarded for the protection of the white man's uh, material, racial, and assumed cultural dominance if he accepts a lower standard of wage than the white union man. But if the Negro unionizes himself to the level of the white worker and in affiliation with him, the choice and preference of employment is given to the white worker without any regard or consideration for the Negro. So like, basically he's saying the capitalist white man is not is just looking for the cheapest labor, you know? and w Which would be the white man. But if, but if the white man and the black man unionize and get a wage, then he will no longer be the cheapest labor. So anyway, I realize this book is between three three volumes i know i said i was going to read the whole thing but i think i'm going to stop at the end of volume one uh you know and i probably won't return i don't know i'll think about it but anyway <laughs> white union is now trying to rope in the negro and make him a standard wage worker then when it becomes generally known that he demands the same wage as the white worker an appeal or approach will be made to the white capitalist or employer to alienate his sympathy or consideration for the negro causing him in the face of all things being equal to discriminate in favor of the white worker as a race duty and obligation. In this respect, the Negro, if not careful to play his game well, uh, which must be done through and by his leader, is between hell and a powder house. 
Uh, the danger of communism to the Negro in countries where his forms the minority of the population is seen in the selfish and vicious attempt of the party or group to use the Negro's vote and physical numbers in helping to smash and overthrow by revolution a system that is injurious to them as the white uh, underdogs, the success of which would put their majority group of race still in power, not only as communists but as white men. To me, this is no difference between two roses looking alike and smelling alike, even if someone calls them by different names. Fundamentally, what racial difference is there between the white communist, Republican, or Democrat? On the appeal of race interest, the communist is as ready as ever to show his racial ascendancy or superiority to the Negro. He will, have, he will be as quick and eager as any to show the Negro that he is white and by divine right of assumption has certain duties to perform to the rest of us. At the rest of us mortals and to defend and protect uh, certain racial ideals against the barbarian hordes that threaten white supremacy. I am of the opinion that the group of whites from whom communists are made in America, as well as the trade unionists and members of the Workers' Party, is more dangerous to the Negroes' welfare than any other group at present. Lynching mobs and wild times, wild time parties are generally made up of 99 and a half percent of such white people. The Negroes should keep shy of communism or the Workers' Party in America. Since they are so benevolent, let them bring about their own reform and show us how different they are to others. We have been bitten too many times by all the other parties, once bitten, twice shy. Negroes have no right with white people's fight or quarrels, except like the humble, hungry, meager dog to run off with the bone when both contestants drop it, being sure to separate himself from the big, well-fed dogs by a good distance, otherwise to be overtaken and then completely undone. If the Negro takes my advice, he will organize by himself and always keep his scale of wage a little lower than the whites until he is able to become, through proper leadership, his own employer. By so doing, he will keep the goodwill of the white employer and live a little longer under the present scheme of things. If not, between communism, white trade unionism, and workers' party, he is doomed in the next 25, 50, or 100 years to complete economic and general extermination. And so this is this is the prediction. This is the general prediction uh, that, that's, that's repeated all throughout uh, black literature even that, you know, yeah, in 25, 50, 100 years, you know, your economic extermination, if you cannot become the employers of your people, like your, extermin your economic extermination is pretty guaranteed. But then again, you have to realize too that to become the employers of your people is really, really difficult in an economy that you do not control. You know, so, so I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like, like again, like it just doesn't make any sense why you're in America. And if you're in America, it doesn't make any sense why you're fighting instead of just, just saying, you know what, we're going to die. You know? Like, that's what I would say. All right, so the Negro needs to be saved from his uh, friends and beware of Greeks bearing gifts. The greatest enemy of the Negroes are among those who hypocritically profess love and fellowship for him when in truth and deep down in their hearts they despise and hate him. Pseudo-philanthropists and their organization are killing the Negro. White men and women of the Moorfield story, Joel Spinger and... Julius Rosenwald, Oswald, Garrison, Villiard, Congressman Dyer, and Mary White Ovington type, in conjunction with the above mentioned agencies, are disarming, disfissioning, uh, disambitioning, and fooling the Negro to death. They teach the Negro to look to the whites in a false direction. They, by their practice, are endeavoring to hold the Negroes in check as a possible dangerous minor minority group, and yet point them to the ex impossible dream of equality that shall never materialize, as they well know and never uh, intended at the same time distracting the Negro from the real solution and objective of securing nationalism. By thus decoying and deceiving the Negro and sidetracking his real objective, they hope to gain time against him in allowing others of their race to perfect the plan by which the blacks are to be completely destroyed as a competitive permanent part of white majority civilization and culture. They have succeeded in enslaving the ignorance of a small group of so-called Negro intellectuals whom they use as agents to rope in the unsuspicious colored or Negro people. They have become resentful and a bitter they have become resentful and bitter towards the Ku Klux Klan and used the influence of their controlled newspapers, white and color, to fight them, not because they so much hate the Klan where the Negro is concerned, but because the Klan, through an honest expression of the white man's attitudes towards the Negro, prepares him to love himself. So I think I think if you're gonna write a book like this with all these other sources and not just put the sources in the back. You know? You don't have to you don't have to do what you're doing right now. Uh, this hypocritical group of whites, like Spinger and, and Story, succeeded in an early group that fooled the Negro during the uh, days of Reconstruction. Instead of pointing the Negro to Africa 
as Jefferson and Lincoln did, they sought to revenge him for the new liberty given him by imprisoning him in the white man's civilization to further rob his labor and exploit his ignorance until he was subsequently ground to death by a newly developed superior white civilization. The plot of these Negro baiters is wretched to contemplate, hence their hatred of me and their influence to crush me in my attempt to save the black race. Between the Ku Klux Klan and the Moorfield Story National Association of the Arabs for the Colored People, Give me the clan for their honesty of purpose towards the Negro. They are better friends to my race for telling us what they are and what they mean, thereby giving us a chance to stir for ourselves and then all the hypocrites put together with their false gods and religions notwithstanding. Religion that they preach will not practice a god they talk about, whom they abuse every day, away with the farce, hypocrisy, and lies. It smells, it stinks to high heaven. I regard the Klan, the Anglo-Saxon club, and white American society, as far as Negro is concerned, as better friends of the race than all other groups of hypocritical whites put together. I like honesty and fair play. You may call me a Klansman if you will, but potentially every white man is a Klansman as well as far as a Negro's competition with whites socially, economically, and politically is concerned, and there's no use lying about it. Capitalism in the state. Capitalism is necessary to the progress of the world, and those... Oh, sorry, so this is Garvey actually talking pretty nice about Garvey about capitalism so dang it all right capital all right hold on a second i gotta i gotta i gotta answer this stupid thing hold on a second 